good night for another stream. It's the fourth night in a row. Amazing. I'm so pleased that we have this kind of weather. Now, uh, I've also added a few extra techniques into the mix today. Uh, so we're going to be able to process these offline a little differently and a little better. So uh, here, here's one of the problems. We, we have uh, snow on the ground, a lot of snow. And that snow causes uh, a light that's aiming down like it should, not up, to reflect back into the sky. So we get an overall whitish hue to the sky, especially near the horizon. So we have to do something about that. We have to mitigate that, get rid of it. And the way we get rid of it is with a haze remover. Uh, you know, it's called an action in Photoshop. It's a haze remover. Now I could have bought some tools to just let me do, uh, just let me do image processing and so forth. And there's plenty of them out there. But you know what? I figured, well, what's the value of that? The value of that is that you know maybe we can certainly get these beautiful tools to help us, but then you're stuck with just the tool and all that the tool can do. You can't do anything more. So I think that that's uh, it's wise to learn how to do it yourse yourself. So uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, hang on one second. Amanda is messaging me. <clears throat> okay. So um, we're starting off again with the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is right here in the middle. Uh, again, uh, for those who are joining us that haven't been here before, uh, you will notice that we have um, we have our telescope control system here. Actually, it's supposed to be down a little more. Uh, move it down. All right, telescope control is here. We have the uh, camera control over here. We have the uh, uh, dome ops here, and we have the dome cams here. Dome cams may run out of battery tonight. And of course, the uh, besides the title and camera control, we have the uh, actual view, which we can change. We can always, uh, you know, get rid of uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, view, so we can actually see it, you know, as a full screen thing. Uh, I love to, I like to do that from time to time. Um, let me just uh, mention something to Amanda here. Uh, okay, so we got that. She should be joining us uh, shortly, I believe. And uh, Daryl Mason will be joining us again as well, which will be kind of fun. Um, so I will be very interested in uh, having them on board with me again as we go through all this. This is a lot of fun. So... Um, and uh, let me, uh, I think uh, you're saying I'm a little quiet. I think it could be the microphone. Uh, maybe this is better. Is this better? You can tell me. Um, uh, I know the music's a little low. I can always raise the music up. But I am going to make sure that I am uh, up pretty high. All right, so... Thank you. I was just actually speaking away from the microphone a little bit, which I tend to do sometimes. Uh, so hang on. I'm going to grab Daryl here. And I apologize for the uh, Skype sounds. I don't like that. <coughs> Hello? And here is Daryl Mason. Hey, Daryl. Welcome to Sky Turtle live stream once again. How are you doing? Thank you, Mark. I'm good. You? Oh, just fine. Thank you. Uh, I think Amanda's going to join us as well. Uh, so, uh -huh. and here I go trying to figure out how to <laughs> add the call. Anyway. Oh, uh, Microsoft well, improved it. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's Microsoft after all. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so how you doing, Daryl? What's going on? Oh, not much. Uh, it uh, was a nice, fairly warm day here today. It clouded up a little bit now it's trying to clear up i went out looking for a day and a half old moon uh, about a half hour after sunset <laughs> didn't see it yeah. uh might still be clouds 
Uh, otherwise, just hanging out. Saw yeah. you come online and came to join you. Thank you. That's fantastic. Well, I'm sure. doing a 15 second photo at 16,000 of the Orion Nebula here, just to well, uh, get a a uh, setup here. So this is our our view right now of the Orion Nebula, and I'm doing it to check focus and see what we got. So as I zoom in, I can see that my focus has held pretty well. I may do a critical focus a little bit later, but we'll see. It looks pretty nice now. Uh, but there's your beautiful Orion Nebula. And I, I'm showing it to you now um, because, of course, we're looking at the Orion Nebula probably uh, in the next month or two. It's going to uh, be less and less visible. I want to get as much of it in as we can because the Orion Nebula is gorgeous. And when it's gone, it's gone. We're not going to be able to... We're not going to be able to see it until next winter, which I'm always willing yep. to wait for. I don't want to see winter, <laughs> as you guys know. I hate winter. Well, yeah. Welcome to the club. Right. And Orion never gets old. No, and this, this is really beautiful. You can see this, this, this dark area here, these dark areas in the Orion Nebula. These are overlying dark clouds of dust that the Orion Nebula is within. In fact, you think of the Orion Nebula as a blister on a very, very large dark cloud area uh, in the universe. And that dark cloud area is known as the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. And we see stars that are forming in here. In fact, uh, if we zoom in uh, a little here, I may have to critically focus to show you after. Uh, or actually, I should just take a, uh, a photograph with a slightly... Uh, well, a much lower ISO to you know, get rid of the noise and also show what I want to show you. But for now, I'll just leave this up. We'll come back to it in a second. Uh, and I'm going to just go over in my main screen here. And I'm going to just drop these parameters down. And let's go down to an ISO of, say, 3200. Okay, and let's do a 15-second exposure. We've dropped it quite a few stops. Okay, quite a few stops. So let's see what happens here. So I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, and I just want to mention, that, of course, that, uh, you know, um, here at Sky Tour Livestream, I really welcome your your input and your, uh, your words of encouragement for things that we do. Um, and I would like to just offer up to you that this is the fourth night in a row that we are streaming this is kind of rare uh, we don't get four nights in a row and usually and uh, I'm really really happy that we have it because uh, it gives us more time to go hunting through the galaxies in Virgo and Leo perhaps later although I have to say uh, the the sky has uh, we do have clouds coming unfortunately so I'm trying to stream uh, before these clouds become a problem for us. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that could be sooner than later that they, they show up. But they're, on, they're, they're down below Orion and below Canis Major, which is the uh, constellation to the left of Orion. But I can show you that. You don't have to take my word for it. If we go over to our planetarium program and just zoom out a little bit, Okay, the horizon's on an angle because basically it's following the way the telescope goes. Well, the clouds are right here. There's a band of clouds right here, uh, and they may be moving up slowly. So we're going to look at Orion, which is kind of low in the sky now, uh, first. And then later, as we bring the telescope back towards center, okay, we can go exploring areas within uh, perhaps Canis Major, look at some of these wonders and then go upwards and maybe check out some of the uh, beautiful constellation of Leo and look at those galaxies again. Uh, right now, if you look at the screen, you'll notice that the, uh, the horizon's at another angle. Okay, the telescope is leaning back and it's pointing toward the north so that as we swing around, okay, we're actually you know cutting a, across the, uh, the uh, celestial equator like this uh, and then if we move up and down, of course, we can do so. Uh, Arcturus is way over toward the east right now, east-northeast. East, and that's a beautiful yellow star. Um, 
but it's it's very low okay so we're not going to be able to see much of it tonight um, it's going to be a while okay so here you can see uh, with these grids you can actually see how far above the horizon our tourist is it's only just under 20 degrees above the horizon so it's not really high at all right but leo the home of all these wonderful galaxies uh, and virgo right next to it uh, is uh, just replete with many galaxies and i have to tell you um i have to tell you this uh this uh gal we took a picture of a galaxy here uh, last night i'm trying to re-identify it uh, i think it was the virgo cluster pinwheel all right and i actually took about 10 or 15 shots of it and i stacked them uh, and it looks beautiful the uh, stacked oh. image looks beautiful so i'm gonna uh, process it in photoshop and then i'm going to uh, show you what it looks like um, and i may if i can if i can do it on the fly i will but it's this guy uh. right here Mark, uh, yeah, yeah, didn't no. the uh, Virgo pinwheel turn out to be M61? Uh, I think that that is M61, isn't it? No, yeah. it's M99, I think. Oh, okay. Let me think here. Let me see. Here we go. Uh, Virgo cluster pinwheel. Yeah, M99. There we go. Yeah, that's Mesher 99. Yep. Okay. Added you by know, Charles Mesher. Seen so many, I'm sorry, seen so many dynamite galaxies lately. <laughs> They're all kind of running together and, in my head. And they do. And they do. Uh, but I'll show it to you, and, and you know, and maybe I've got. The, I'm hoping that's the right one. I believe it is the right one. Um, it was just so beautiful. I could see such a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful structure in the spiral arms when I looked at the photograph earlier. Uh, uh -huh. That it's worth uh, checking out even more. So we'll be back to it in a bit. Uh, we have to let it come up out of the murk first if we can get that much time. Uh, but okay. let's say, let's go back to uh, where we are in Orion. This is where we are. We're down here. If you wonder where Orion was, of course, here is where we're looking, okay? We have Orion here, which is these four stars. We have Betelgeuse at the top left, Bellatrix, Rigel down here, and Saif, and then Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka, which are the central belt stars. Uh, this is the view of our telescope right here, uh, and this is down below the belt of stars. Uh, we have uh, the Orion Nebula. We have the Running Man Nebula, and we have other stars and, and so forth down here. Now, if we look at some more of the details down here, right down here below the Orion Nebula, we have this other little tiny nebula, which is really cool. We looked at it yesterday, um, and it makes for a beautiful object, and we'll check it out once again in a little while. Uh, but anyway, I just want to uh, welcome all of you to Sky Tour Livestream, and thank you for coming along for the ride once again. Uh, I'm very happy, like I said, that we've got uh, four days of of uh, streaming that we could do. You know. Oh, you've been like a kid in a candy shop the last few nights. Who me? You. <laughs> yeah, I guess, huh? I mean, you've obviously been enjoying yourself, and sh uh, it's great to share it with everybody. I know, and let me tell you, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm very. Uh, anxious to like look at almost anything i can look at you know because i look oh, yeah. at these things and you know and yes we see objects that are beautiful and these wonderful objects when i look at them i see astrophysics i see physics at play you know how do these galaxies get this structure and this this amazing uh structure we see in the spiral arms you know and that's a question that I, like everybody likes to ask and you know i like to answer them i like to tell people well here's how the spiral arms formed you know and then when you tell them, you say things, well, I think it's a, people say, well, you know, are they spinning around? Um, and actually, the spiral arms in the galaxy are, are what are called density waves. And what the heck is a density wave? Well, I'll tell you what it's like. If you're on a highway and you're traveling along and you reach a traffic jam, you slowly proceed through and then you clear the traffic jam and you keep going. But from the air, you see that even though you pass through the traffic jam, it's still there and the cars now that you came out of the traffic jam but the, but the traffic jam is still there progressing forward ever so slowly uh, and so the cars all slow down behind you they enter the traffic jam then they leave the traffic jam well if the traffic jam is where the spiral arms are now you see how the spiral arms actually uh, exist they are like never made up of the same stars they change and it's because they move through 
that area of, of concentration. And of course, in that area of concentration, we have things like uh, gas and dust that uh, the consequences of striking that gas and dust release the, uh, uh, more light and cause more things to happen, which cause densities to build up, cause compression of, of, of clouds uh, that, of course, result in stars. So that becomes an area where stars are formed, where they knot up and where they collect uh, and where, they, where basically where everything knots up. So uh, that's how the spiral arms actually work. Uh, in a sense, they're kind of like a, a a fluid motion wave of some sort, you know, that you would imagine like that. Uh, I want to just go back to our uh, live view for a second to uh, just make sure that we're golden here. Yeah, we are. Okay, you can see the dome cam. We're looking right out of the slit there. Uh, and you can see with our telescope here, we have a good view. Um, and now I want to say... Um, um, I'm actually going to try and do a little focus. I want to do some critical focus because I don't think that uh, we actually did get the uh, the focus fully right. I think there's a little bit of focusing that we need to do. So let's get back. we will go west a little bit. Whoops, that's too much. <laughs> Lucky me, I forgot to uh, I forgot to uh, I forgot to do this. I forgot to change the amount that we're moving the telescope so now we're going to do it again and now we'll bring the orion nebula back in slow mark could i ask a favor would you have a moment sure uh could you share your screen with me on skype oh of course i, I forgot to do that that's fine uh, sorry you're a busy guy no that's okay that's perfectly fine and let's see if i can figure out oh that's there okay hang on let me just get to the get to our call here uh, where are we <laughs> I, I should be this should be a call okay here we go so now I should just say uh, share screen and share the sound and start sharing there you go so now you can see what I see at the same time you got it you're on mute. We'll just wait for Daryl to come back to us. Are you still there, Daryl? Well, it doesn't matter. He'll be back. Okay, so I'm going to just move us over a little more like i said i want to get the orion nebula back it should be back here momentarily i'm such a retard pardon me no no i i said you know you're on mute yes yeah <laughs> I, I just had to find the mute button <laughs> i have too many windows open <laughs> that's okay all right so what i'm gonna do now is i'm going to uh just uh focus a little bit and just try and get a critical focus here I like doing that. So here you can see the stars actually being defocused. Actually, it's instructional to do this. I'll show you why. You'll notice that as I defocus the stars, you actually see, uh, when you look at the stars, you actually see that there's differences not only in brightness, but color. Now, it doesn't show much here, but we used a defocusing technique, technique, and it's actually one we learned uh, when we were getting a degree in astronomy. We actually used the defocused stars to accurately gauge the color. All right, because the color is easier to gauge when the star is defocused, and you give the eye more surface area of the uh, object to determine color with. All right, so uh, but so when it's a point, they kind of all look about the same, don't they? So like here, when we look at the trapezium, which is this these four stars in here, the trapezium one, two, three, four stars. These are, they look all the same, and they're, they're all about the same age. But the thing is, when we look at other stars, they kind of all look about the same color, yet they're not. Um, and that's, uh, that's because of the, the fact that the stars actually have uh, uh, very subtle color differences that you don't actually see unless you go forward and defocus the image to see the colors. That's how 
you can quickly see the colors of the stars. Another way is to do a time exposure where you let the stars trail across the screen uh, and then you see these amazing colors. And we'll, maybe we'll do that tonight if, uh, if, I, uh, can be, uh, if I can remember to do that. I will need someone to remind me, like maybe Daryl or somebody, you know, but we'll, we'll do it. Okay, so... I'll try to remember. That's okay. So here we are on the Orion Nebula now. Uh, you can see the focus is, is a lot better. Um, and I want to uh, point out this area right here. This is something we talked about last night, but I think it's in interesting because um, the... Uh, <laughs> thanks, 2W. <Dude> w. <laughs> Don't forget to do that. Okay. Um, if we look at this area right here, the Orion Nebula is known as an emission reflection nebula. So there's areas in the Orion Nebula that are reflecting light and areas that are emitting light. Uh, and you say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense to me. It does if you consider that uh, it's made of mostly hydrogen, but it also has oxygen atoms and, and other elements from other star material that's been spread to the interstellar medium through supernovae. And, <clears throat> of course, supernovae are the, the uh, cataclysmic explosions of, of old stars that are massive that have run out of their nuclear fuel. And when the stars uh, like the trapezium were born inside this uh, cloud of gas and dust, okay, they have a healthy supply of ultraviolet radiation. And this ultraviolet radiation will shine out onto the elements in the cloud and I know this looks like it's reflections okay but it's not this is actually emission it's glowing the ultraviolet energy from the stars in this nebula cause the oxygen for instance to to glow the oxygen atoms to glow it causes the hydrogen atoms which make this characteristic red to glow and so we see that these nebulae are called emission nebulae for that reason and because there's a component of the Orion Nebula that has uh, dust that's being reflected, that's reflecting some of the starlight, then we have a reflection nebula too. So it's an emission reflection nebula, an ER type uh, object. Um, and if we want to talk about uh, an object that's just reflection, well, then we can actually go up a little bit from the Orion Nebula. We've talked about this one before as well. Uh, and I don't even have to go anywhere, but just go up. So I can just say, let's head north. And all we have to do is head up north. The Orion Nebula barely gets out of the view. All right. And I'll just go a little further to center it up. And now, if we do a 15-second exposure, and I'm going to increase the uh, ISO sensitivity because I would like to show it to you better. Oh, there's Amanda. She is here. So we'll do 16,000 for 15 seconds. <clears throat> Okay, and while we're doing that, I'm going to guess that Amanda is ready to come in. Uh, and Daryl, if I cut you off, ugh, I really don't know what to tell you. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to add her to the call without causing problems here, but I just don't, I just don't know how this is going to uh, work properly. And maybe That's she, fine. All right, so let me just uh, figure it out. Amanda will fix it. She always does. She does. She always does. All right. And meanwhile, so, I can't even figure out how to work Skype here. I have a message, and I can't get to it. <laughs> well, uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, you probably want to hit those little three bars, and then it'll bring it to your chat. And actually, not to your chat, but to your the, the person that sent you the message, and then you just scroll uh, to the person. Let very me call, good. I got it. Okay. Let me call Amanda and then uh, get her in, and then we can do the, the other thing, okay? Sure. Well, let's see. Uh, she says, press that and look on my name on the list. On the right corner, she says, circle. Uh, hang on, folks. I'm going to try and figure this out. With a plus sign, uh, it'll be a circle with a plus sign. Yet, yeah, no, we don't We don't have that here in, in this particular version, unless uh, she's talking about. I you, have it. You do? Yeah. Let me see what happens here. Uh, All right. Okay, we're we're just figuring this out. Skype keeps easy. updating. Easy for her to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I found the circle with the plus sign in it, Amanda, and I see you, and I've got you checked. And uh, let's see what this does. Uh, 
Doesn't look like it's doing anything. Uh, carry on, Mark. All right. Or I, I can drop out. You call Amanda. She can call me like we usually do. All right. I'm, I'm, I'll just have her do it. All right, Daryl, I'll be right back to you, okay? Very good. Hang on. Something's happening. Uh, yeah, uh, Daryl got lost because uh, we we can't. There's no plus sign in, in anywhere. There is a plus sign. He had it. He was so close. I was listening to you guys. He was so close. Okay, Daryl, hang up the call with Mark and come to me. Okay, so here he is. Hi, Daryl. Hello. Here he is. You were so close. You had it. No, I thought I did, but um, I didn't do it. Uh, I need to reboot my computer. It's probably a lot of my problems. I, there's stuff missing on my screen. Uh, now all I need is to get Mark's uh, screen back. Yeah, I got to do that. Okay, there should be a new open group call with the three of us. Yeah, I got to share. I'm going to be sharing right now so you guys can see it and hear music. So there you are. You guys should have it now. There it is. Yeah, I think it's coming up now. And so, it is. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And now what we did was we took a picture of the Running Man Nebula, which we were talking about the Orion Nebula, which was this one that we took just a few seconds ago. Oops, not that one. It was the one, but uh, this one here. Okay. And then I took a picture of the Running Man Nebula here and a little processing to help bring it out. This one has more of a blue in it, and that blue is what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, Reflection Nebula. The oxygen atoms in the Orion Nebula, those uh, are excited and re uh, they actually glow uh, in this teal, kind of teal blue uh, uh, light. And that teal blue light, okay, is uh, this light here. And I will come back here and just get rid of the, uh, it's this light right here that we're seeing. This is that teal blue, see it? All right, in here. These are oxygen atoms doing this, and then the red are the hydrogen atoms, like we've said. But in the Running Man Nebula, it's different. We actually have the Running Man, Neb Running Man Nebula. This is a blue color, uh, and then there's a little bit of red hydrogen uh, that's being excited here uh, and, and doing that, okay? But mostly this is dust, and we're getting this uh, dust that's causing the, uh, the reflection uh, of the starlight and thus we see the light in the blue color of the stars uh, and the blue light from the stars are actually being is being scattered by those little tiny uh, dust grains that are in the nebula and those dust grains will cause um, us to see them as, as blue uh, with, with scattering going on similar to how we see blue sky uh, which is scattered blue light from the atmospheric molecules um, and I mentioned before that the Orion Nebula and everything associated with it around it is part of the uh, great Orion molecular cloud. Uh, so all this out here is dark dust and, and gas that's not being illuminated. It's all part of that. And this is like a blister on the edge of this uh, amazing uh, Orion molecular cloud complex. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, so... I think that, uh, you know, as I said, the Orion Nebula is going to uh, be moving into, uh, you know, our, uh, it'll be our previous season's constellation of Orion in just a little short time. Um, and we'll see it a little bit here and there, but we're probably not going to see much of the Orion Nebula in the next couple of months because it'll be setting question. sooner. I have a good question. I want to hear it. Well, it's probably not a good question. It's probably... I don't know. Don't, it's, don't I just ask. I think it's ask. an interesting question because, well, I don't know the answer. So, therefore, it is a good question. But All right. um, are you guys... You guys, are the Americans changing their time forward this weekend as well? Um, yes, I, yes, I, I believe yes. that yes, we, we, we all do... forward an hour. Well, I hate daylight savings time. We all do except uh, for Arizona. Arizona, yeah. Um, what does that mean for the sky? Nothing. Because if you're counting, like, wasn't it like every four minutes the sun rises a little earlier each day after the vernal equinox or something? 
Uh, the sun has been rising earlier every day since the last winter solstice, last December 22nd, approximately. Right, right. Uh, okay, if, so what happens when we spring forward an hour? Is is it still, uh, like, does the sky still do the four minutes each day, or does that jump by an hour, or do we have something that kind of counters that jump forward and jump back in the fall. No, no uh, the sun will rise an hour later and the sun will set an hour later, according to the clock. Right, but uh, not according to...
meeting. Operation. What it looks like. There you are. Oh, you're no. back. Fire out. Hello. Hello. So you're back. I never left. <laughs> I know you didn't. Uh, I was. I had an audio issue that popped up out of uh -huh. nowhere. Uh, I don't know why. Um, uh, and can I say uh, the last thing I heard you say before you vanished? You had that metallic tone like you did last night before you. Uh, I had trouble hearing you. Yeah. And then it, you just went away. Okay. Well, that's not sure what caused okay, well, that. You're back now, so yay. Yeah. Thank you all for standing by. Um, you were still seeing live video, uh, just a glitch in the audio, but thank you all for hanging in there. We are back. Yeah, and I actually feverishly was, was playing with the uh, settings, and I managed to uh, get it to come back. I actually had to... Uh, I actually had to... I was going to shut down everything, okay? Then I realized, no, I don't have to do that. So I started playing with some of the settings, and I managed to grab it and get it back. Uh, and if it happens again, I might be able to fix it. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Just do you remember what you did? That's um, important. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bravo. By the way, I want to say hi to Happy Guy from Mount Shasta. Um, are we live now? We are. You Hello, are. everybody. We are live again. I don't. I know that. Um, I, I I noticed that my my mic audio went to zero, and I couldn't hear anything. And Skype didn't work. I literally shut down Skype, restarted Skype, didn't change anything. But we're back now. And can um, you still hear Daryl and I talking? I'm talking to you. Yeah. No, I couldn't. No, no, no before no. <clears throat> I heard nothing. I didn't even hear the music. Uh, and I was the source of the music, and it wasn't even playing. I mean, I couldn't hear it, and I saw that. So it I could was... hear the music on YouTube, but Daryl and I could still talk to each other on Skype. Yeah, you got. It just seemed like you were just totally missing from the equa equation. I know. I figured you know you guys could have carried it and gone on and done a Sky tour without me. I would have been okay with that, but you know, mm. you know, Daryl could have handled it. You know, you could have also handled. it, I think. Well, anyway, we don't have to worry about anyway. that now. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to worry about that now. Um, they're back as they should be. Yeah, it's always an adventure. It's always an adventure, yeah. I'm going to uh, take us up to our planetarium view right now because I'd like to take us up to a few more things in Orion. Actually, I want to take us down to this little guy, uh, the 13th Pro. We looked at this uh, yesterday as well, um, and I'd like to uh, bring us there again to kind of show you this little thing because this is such a neat little uh, nebula that no one even notices it many times. They don't even see it, you know, and, but it's there and it's the coolest thing. Uh, and we'll check it out. Uh, let me just make sure that the telescope, yep, telescope is ready. So we'll do 15 seconds at 16,000. That's actually perfect for this. So let's see what happens. Uh, and, and now <clears throat> this little nebula is also called the rubber stamp nebula because there's a a very distinct black dark object that is obscuring some of the brighter nebula behind it. Okay, and there it is on the upper right of the screen there. All right, I'm actually zoomed out a little bit, so let me zoom in, uh, or sorry, uh, move it around and then zoom in. Okay, but here you go, this is it. <coughs> okay, so that's a, that is a uh, nebula that's called the uh, rubber stamp nebula or the uh, uh, what's what's the other name for it here let me just go quickly through the thing here okay Pearl. yeah it's this the 13th Pro but it's also um, it's also called uh, it's it's, it's NG, oh yeah that's why duh. NGC 1999 from the new general catalog a really neat uh, little nebula and I think that uh, you know it, it gets uh it gets its name obviously from the fact that we see this dark area, this dark little uh, part of it right here. And actually, we don't even need to take a photograph that's that uh, high in the ISO. We can actually capture this down at around uh, maybe 6400. Let's do 15 seconds at 6400. Okay, so we'll do that again and check it out. I'm sure that. Uh, it would be really interesting <clears throat> to see it again. 
uh, without the noise. The 13th Pearl, that's another one of those fanciful names. I wonder where that came from. I actually don't know. I don't know. You know. It's Are not the call other like it in the area? Yeah. Isn't you it? Know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, is there a 12th Pearl? <laughs> you would think. Right? Okay, so this is, um, this is the nebula. And you can actually see this beautiful dark, this is dark dust. It's obscuring the nebula around this star. This is actually in the foreground. Uh, it's a really interesting, uh, you know, a really interesting nebula. We have I've seen this before, uh, and I can't I can't tell you enough that this is one of those things that's just uh, amazing. Like if we if we just drop down, uh, let me just change some of the some of the uh, parameters here. Give us a little bit of processing. You said that's a nebula? It is. Is there a tinge of blue on the top there? There is indeed. <clears throat> and and there's a reason for that. What kind of nebula has blue, Amanda? Like this. I guess you're looking for a little more than a hot one. Than yeah. an O type. Yeah. Start, that's a... Starts with a P, Amanda. It starts with a P. Oh, planetary. No. 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 <laughs> My bad. I'm sorry. No. Oh the, well. It starts okay, with well, it, it starts with an it R. A dark nebula? It starts with an R. Uh, an reflection R? nebula. Yeah. yeah. This is a reflection nebula. Yeah. And then there's this dark, this dark uh, obscuring dust, which is between us and that rest of the nebula behind it, and it's obscuring it. But it tends to look like a really interesting little. Uh, a little hole in space, basically, essentially. Uh, it's, it's just cool, you know? Kind of reminds me of the Black Eye Galaxy. Yeah, that's right, Black Eye Galaxy. What constellation is that? Is that... Uh... Uh, I forget. Okay, we can find that one. I thought, is that not in Leo, is it? Mm -hmm. Is it in Leo? I'm not sure. I don't remember. I know you, you showed it to us before. It seemed like sure it was I some did. months ago. Yeah, so... Yeah. Okay, well... Yeah. The Black-Eyed Nebula? Black-Eyed Galaxy? Yeah, Black-Eyed Black Galaxy. Black-Eyed Galaxy. Yeah, yeah Black-Eyed Galaxy. Yeah, 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 actually, if you want to just look up at Google, Amanda, just I'm, I'm, I'm doing other things, but look up uh, Black-Eyed Galaxy and uh, see what constellation it's in. Uh, Coma Bernices. Okay, so see, that's what I thought. I, I, you know, it's it was west of, uh, or rather, east of Virgo, uh, and heading toward uh, Arcturus. I misspoke last night, Mark. Uh, Coma Berenice should be north of Virgo. Yeah, no, it's it's. I'll show you. I mean, you'll see where it is. Uh, in terms of the telescope, okay. Uh, if we look is at, it Messier sixty four? I believe you're right, Amanda. Okay. So, like, if we come over here, we're moving well, through Google's the sky. Right, not me. <clears throat> okay, so now, okay, this is Cancer. The beehive is in Cancer, uh, and Cancer is the crab. How do you know? Well, we just do this, and you can see the crab. Okay, uh, and I this is Leo the lion. Okay, the sickle is his mane, and we got that triangular part at the back of his body. Okay, like that, where his tail is, and then. Um, if we go left more, we're actually now in Virgo, okay, which is here, all right? Uh, yeah, that's that's and called right Baron here, Isis directly above it. Yeah, and this right here, here, yeah, it's 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 east of Leo. Here's yeah. Leo, Wait. and we go east. But what what is that thing? Oh, this is Coma, actually. I'm sorry, what, Coma Berenice, uh, Bernice. What's hair. it supposed to be though? Hair. Uh, hair. Hair. Oh. <laughs> it's a lady's hair. Yeah, and if you notice, oh, here's the Black yeah. Eye Galaxy right there. Yeah. The Black Eye Galaxy is uh, measure 64, like you said. Uh, it's also NGC 4826. Uh, and it's interesting because it's really an interesting galaxy that's, uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, where it is, it's actually uh, uh, 24 million light years away. So it's uh, a very uh, fascinating uh, thing to look at, but if we look at the sky where I'm having it located you see that it's on a steep angle 
that means our telescope would be you know way over on an angle looking down at it because it's still rising uh, and and still in some murk and right now it's at about 40 degrees up but it's also in some of the murk around here and we're actually over in, in this region right now uh, we're actually over here and we're gonna move over I may have to go move the dome so we can get out into this region and look around <clears throat> what, what was beside the snake to the left of the snake is that a telescope that's a sextant what is that? that looks like a sextant to me yeah sextant yep and this is is that what sailors use? Yep, that's correct. Yeah. That's right. Right. And, um... What's that, a chalice? Uh, this? A chalice. Yeah. Uh, this oh, is... Uh, uh, there to the lower left? This. No. Yeah, she's talking about circling. right this. Oh, that's a sextant. No, no, not this. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you, I'm, a, are you I'm on... Line? I'm yeah, yeah, to yeah don't look at YouTube. Come okay. back to Skype. Yeah, that is crater than cup, Amanda. Yes. Crater. C R A T E R, crater, which just means cup. Yep. Uh, and to the right there where Mark is now, that's Corvus. Corvus the crow. The crow yep. Oh, hi Corvus. I like that. Yeah. I didn't know there was a crow in there. That's right. Yeah. When uh, Halley's comet went away back in 1986, uh, it vanished in that direction. It uh, it dropped down into Centaurus at its closest, and then it started coming back up, and it uh, headed out into it was either I think it was Crater, it was Crater or Corvus, and it headed <clears> off <throat> into space in that direction. Yep. And this snake you were talking about, this is Hydra. Yep. Okay. Hydra. This is the nuclear reactor. Hydra, <laughs> the one where if you cut off its head, another one grows back, or two more grow back. Uh, uh, Hydra the water snake. Yeah, this is uh. Yeah. Who this... am I thinking of? Uh, Medusa. You talking about Medusa? No. I don't think so. Oh, when oh, you was cut it, when you cut its head off, three heads would come back. Yeah. Oh gosh. Is that the Hydra? That? Uh, I only know the constellation is Hydra the water snake. I don't know oh. about uh, you know, the head getting cut off and coming back. Well, see, that's what Amanda uh, likes, though. She likes the mythology. Um, so, well, yeah. you do know because you knew it was three heads that came back. And something's uh, telling me it's in Greek <laughs> mythology, and I was. It is. Sure it it is. Uh, is it Cerberus? The dog at the gates of hell? No, that's uh, just a three headed head. dog. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd have to do a search. Maybe yeah, you I'd could have do to do a search. I'd have to figure it out, too. Methuselah? Hmm? She said Methuselah. I don't think so. No, oh. that was Laura's guess. Oh. I thought it was Hydra, but Tim That's says okay. Hydra. He's with me. Yeah. Okay. Good old Tim from the UK. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, I'm gonna. I want to take us up to this cluster if we can get to it. Is that the shoe buckle? Yes, it is. No. Um, and I'd like to see if we can get there. I had an accident in the dome um, recently uh, <clears throat> where I actually, uh, when I tried to uh, move the telescope at a certain point, it actually ended up, uh, it ended up, uh, I see now what happened here. It's trying to, it ended up striking the uh, top because I had a, uh, uh, okay, now that's, I knew that was going to happen. It starts. It struck the top of the uh, the dome. There's a little uh, piece of uh, plastic that hangs down. That's a handle for closing the dome shutter because I don't have it automated yet. And uh, the telescope struck that and and shattered the dew cap on the end of the telescope. Uh, oh no! Well, that's all right. I mean, I made the dew cap, so you know, I'll just make another. But uh, it's still working. So I'm gonna move over here just a little bit so I can. Then <laughs> I know, DW, I gotta, I have to change the batteries. Actually, um, I'm slow on getting, uh, I'm getting them changed. Uh, we, we might have a little red in this when we look at this, but let's just, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna take a, just a, a quick shot of this particular cluster. I'll do eight seconds. All right. And if we see red, then I, I know that the dome is interfering. I have a red light on inside the dome <clears throat> and in my office. 
I've told you before, I have the, uh, yeah, I see a little bit of red. Uh, I have a... Uh, it's a pretty picture, though. It is, it's pretty, but it's not realistic. <clears throat> you know, because I got to uh, do just a little interference from the dome. This is, of course, M35 in the constellation Gemini. And what happens to the star images when you're when you actually are uh, near uh, the edge of the dome is they get some really strange artifacts. Okay, like so the dome causes these kinds of weird things to occur on bright stars because there's a sharp edge in the dome, and so we end up seeing that like that. Now I can tell the focus probably can be taken care of a little better than this. We got a um, as temperatures drop, you know, it's very, very cold out there right now, but as temperatures drop, uh, it will then change the uh, focal uh, requirements and we have to change the focus in the dome. So it, it's uh, on the telescope, I mean. So that's something we'll have to do uh, as well. And uh, it is what it is. Um, so uh, now that said, um, let me... Uh, First of all, let's turn off this guy. And when you don't need it now, we'll just use Dome Cam 2. So, um, we're looking here at M35, but let's go back to, uh, let's go back to our, our persistent planetarium. Get rid of this, and let's take a look now. We're, we're way up here, all right, and we're interfering with the dome just a little bit so uh, maybe there's a few other things we should look at down below here um, we've seen the Orion Nebula as we said um, and this is the a nebula called Casper the Friendly Ghost um, it's actually if you look at it in detail it's okay it's actually M78 all right measure 78 so we can check that out and measure 78 is a really pretty object I spent time photographing a number of them and then ended up uh, uh, bringing them um, uh, into into Photoshop and uh, was able to draw out a, a lot of detail from them so that's kind of cool <clears throat> you might try the 37 cluster up in that general area also okay Looks like a big number 37 floating out in space. What's what's the actual name of the cluster? Uh, they just call it the 37 cluster, I think. I saw it on your Stellarium screen a minute ago. Oh, okay. Well, we'll check it out. Let's do um, 15 seconds at 12,800 here uh, and get a little bit of this uh, reflection nebula. This is another one of those reflection nebulae that we often talk about. Uh, and it's a nebula that uh, uh, is a beautiful shade of blue when you can see it. It's actually, uh, it depends on, on the quality of the night. As I said, there's a lot of, well, I didn't know if I said this tonight, but there's actually a lot of uh, moisture in the air. Uh, however, you see, you see here it is. Okay, you can see this reflection nebula. It's very clear here. Uh, and if we uh, actually uh, go to yeah, do some quick processing on it to kind of help you see a little better what we're looking at uh, we can just process it enough to show you what's going on here it's really pretty see that isn't that pretty yeah. you know and and I, this is something we use in astronomy called averted vision if you're looking right at this object you don't see as much of the cloudy nebulous uh, cloud and the nebula nebulosity we call it but if you look over here all right you'll see it with your peripheral vision a lot better and we use that technique when we're looking through the telescope too in the eyepiece <coughs> and dw saying uh he he's saying to remind me to do that thing i wanted to do and that thing was i do remember that too i'm trying to remember what that thing was daryl do you remember I remember you were supposed to do it. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> uh, I'm what, sorry. Was it critically focused? Because I did. Uh, it was something like that, I think. Okay. You were going to go back and check something. Okay. I think it was a critical focus, maybe. But I, I did do it. Um, but 
if that's not what it was, I'm sure they will be more than happy to tell me. I have the best stream viewers on Earth. And I know it's a story a few of us have heard before. It's a great story. I love the story, but I'm going to request it one more time because we have a new, uh, a new viewer, Steve Evans. Oh, hi, Steve. Did you see his comment? I do. I just read about just Clyde read Tomba. About, mm. And you have a bit of a history with Mr. Tombo as well. I do, actually. I, I actually uh, I sat down with Clyde on a hillside. He was doing an astronomy uh, talk at a, at a, at a uh, little uh, uh, astronomy. I say not little. There were thousands of people there at, at a gathering where we were. Um and hold Skull. on a second. Who is he first off? Well, he... Skullifay? Yes. And, and Clyde was uh, going to be giving a talk there. Hold on. Who is he first? <clears throat> I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. He's the, he's the man who found Pluto. Yes. Yep. Uh-huh. And, okay, and, and... Go on with your story. Yeah, sure. And, and so uh, Clyde it was a very, very, very slight man. He's a very... He was small. Probably four foot nine, maybe five feet tall at the most. Uh, and he talked like this in a very, very small voice, you know. And I was sitting with him on a hillside up there and talking about Pluto. And he was just leaning back, checking things out, watching the people with their telescopes and everything. And he looked at me and he said something like, wow, you know, this is really quite a, a, a cool gathering, you know. Everybody, he had never been to cellophane. And I said, yeah, I, I used to basically come up every year, at Clyde, and I, I just... You know, it, it's been a great deal of fun. You know, we've had a lot of good people here, and you can see this is the upper part of that nebula right here. Let me just uh, show that. So now you can see it right there. Um, the other one is just out, out of the bottom, down here at the bottom. Uh, so he was uh, <clears throat> he was uh, very gracious, very kind. He had an excellent talk. Um, I wasn't speaking or anything at the, at the time there, uh, and. We had such a uh, a good time listening to him, and then he uh, he turned around and and um, basically uh, said, you know, that uh, as far as he was concerned, you know, Pluto uh, uh, is uh, a real gem in our solar system. He thinks that there might be more. He even suggested there might be more beyond Pluto, um, and how right he was. You know, the Kuiper Belt is littered with uh, objects smaller than Pluto, but still uh quite a number of them you know and so he was he was right he was right about all that and uh to that end i uh i just thought that he was uh, the most brilliant astronomer ever my favorite astronomer remains carl sagan uh, carl sagan inspired a whole new generation of astronomers including me um and i thought that was really good you know it was great for me uh the person that inspired me the most however to get into astronomy was someone that I had never met, um, and it was a man by the name of uh, Bert Lee. Uh, and Bert Lee was a guy that uh, was a scientist at NASA, oh gosh, uh, back in 1969, 1970. Uh, and I had just had an operation, and I went, uh, and uh, when I was home, I had nothing else to do, so I actually, you know, did whatever you nine-year-old does i designed a space station uh and i drew it out on notebook paper with plans and arrows using a ruler i drew arrows with a ruler you know and everything and made comments and said exactly what was going on okay this is this is how astronauts can go to the bathroom in space this is how they can get food this is how we can do this that and the other and i, I said this is how we get gravity and i had the thing spinning at a certain rate to make one you know the force of gravity on the space station <clears throat> And I sent this plan on ripped notebook paper that came out of a, a, a spiral binder, <clears throat> and I sent it to NASA. And uh, there was a young NASA scientist there that read it by the name of Bert Lee. And uh, he took the time to look at every page, make comments on every page, okay? And he, uh, <clears throat> he, he, he did the most amazing thing. He filled a big cardboard box full of plastic model kits, books, mission patches, brochures, everything under the sun that a nine-year-old kid could want. And he sent it to me. 
uh, back with my and, and inside uh, a Manila folder was my uh, was my plan uh, that I had designed, and I just figured I'd never hear from anybody at NASA. I mean, I was it was such a big deal. I sent it to NASA. Wow. And then I get uh, I get this box when I get home from uh, school one day, and my mother goes, "There's a big box out here for you." I went, "What?" And it said NASA on the return envelope, on uh, the return address, uh, with a sticker. And you know what? I didn't want to throw that thing away. I, I kept that box for years because it said NASA on it, and it was addressed to me. That's right. I got something from NASA. <laughs> so, but he took the uh, he took the time to look at my plan, and when I read oh, over my plan again, I went through it. He actually, I read all his comments, things like he circled like my uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, scrubber system that I came up with um, and it wouldn't have worked it was uh, simpleton at the time simpleton simpleton's version and he goes this is on the right track this is excellent we, we do this kind of thing now uh, you know keep going wonderful job uh, and he had comments like that all over it and a little pla- little paper check marks little I'm sorry paper little um, uh, pencil check marks on every page that told me he had looked at every single page uh, and uh, so then, you know, he sent me a letter that said, thank you for sending this. I hope this material helps to encourage you to get into the, uh, the back then it was called the manned space program, the manned space program. Um, and I thought it was pretty cool. And uh, so I kept that. Um, I, I, I kept that box for years. And I showed people things and lost a few things. And over time, the contents of the box got spread to the winds. Um, over time, and the box itself just fell apart. I had it so many years. Uh, but then it was like 45 years later. I remembered Bert Lee at NASA, and I contacted him where he was working, uh, and he wrote me back uh, in an email, of course. This was like, literally just like three years ago. And he said to me, Wow, he goes, because I told him the story I just told you. And he, and he goes, wow, he goes, I I don't remember you specifically. He goes, but that's me. I would have done that exact thing. That was what I did. I wanted to give young young people, a, a, you know, an encouragement to get into the space program. And I wrote him back and said, well, you did, okay? You, you encouraged me um, to the point where I actually uh, got into astronomy and got a degree in astronomy. Uh, and now that is what I'm doing for a living, you know. Um, and so he basically said, oh, let's keep in touch and so forth. And so we do. But uh, and, and you say, well, who is this guy, Bert Lee? Well, he goes by a different name. He, he has a nickname. Uh, it's Gentry. So his name is Gentry Lee. And he is the chief engineer uh, for the outer space, the outer robotics missions, actually, uh, to the outer solar system for JPL, uh, and he's been the guy that's responsible for the Mars rovers. He's responsible for New Horizons that went past Pluto. He's responsible for Galileo, Cassini. He's responsible for all these outer space missions, the missions that showed us that Enceladus uh, at Saturn has an ocean beneath its its, its icy crust. Uh, he's responsible for uh, the findings that Europa has geysers that indicate that maybe it has life in a deep ocean under its ice. You know, this is the man that, you know, has driven all those missions with his engineering skill. Okay. Without him, it wouldn't happen. Uh, And I just found it such a kick that the man who went through my plan when I was nine went on to become the guy that basically is the chief engineer for JPL. Such a cool story, you know, it's so much fun. Um, And I've never met him. I've never met the guy once, but I would love to. Um, uh, Just a tremendous man. So, sorry about, you know, for those that heard that story, if it's a repeat, I apologize. No, it's just, I thought it was, sorry. Go ahead, Daryl. No, please, go ahead. I, I just thought it was really interesting that a newcomer um, to Steve out there, yeah, he Steve said Evans. he's not really into astronomy. He was just admiring the setup and what we were doing and everything. And of all people to mention, 
I know, For someone right? who's not into astronomy, he just happened to recently see a video on Clyde, Clyde Tombaugh. Clyde Tombaugh, yeah. And, you know, just happens to be someone you've actually... And, unfortunately, he's passed now, but just from that story, of all the stories you've told, of all the people you've met, I think I would have really, really liked to have met him. Oh, he was. He yeah. seems just from that story. He seems like such a sweetheart. You know I think what? he would have been lovely. I think Tomba, he was. He was a very nice person. He was very self-effacing. Oh yes. Uh, Tomba goes back to the days, the olden days, the good old days of astronomy. Uh, he was a farm boy in Kansas, wasn't he, Mark? And he was an amateur astronomer. Yeah. Uh, I I've seen old pics of him with a telescope he built and. He got a job at the observatory in Flagstaff, and uh, that's how he got his professional start. And he was looking at uh, blink comparators, I think it was, yes. and uh, that's how he discovered Pluto. That's right. And, and when people, when we, we talk about blink comparators, uh, you can blink your left and right eye, you know, r really fast. And if your left eye was seeing an image that was slightly different from the right eye, as you blink faster and faster with your eyes, you would see the difference and it would stand out, whereas you might not see it if you had both eyes open, okay? Uh, and a blink comparator uh, did it in the following way. You would look through uh, the, the opening, you'd look down at the, at the object, but it would blink, the, it would show you two different images itself, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, well, the early ones you, used your, you would use your eyes to do it, but uh, in the later versions, they would just flicker two images back and forth, and the things that are different would stand right out at there and right out at you. So it's uh, that's what a, a blink comparator does. It shows you two successive images, maybe taken a day or two apart or a week apart or whatever. And the stars don't change their position in a week, okay? But anything like a planet would be in a different spot. And that's how Pluto was found. Uh-huh. Yeah. When I went to New Mexico for the uh, annular eclipse uh, back in the mid-90s, I, uh, I stayed at, uh, uh, oh God, I'm having a brain lock, uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Yes. When I was down there, and that's where Mr. Tomball was living at the time. Yeah. And I, I remember thinking, gosh, it sure would be nice to meet the man. I never did, of course. I didn't oh. want to be a bother. It's not like I'd go knocking on his door or anything. But... Uh, yeah, he. Uh, that's where he uh, retired to, I think, was Las Cruces. Yeah, and to Dave Schmidt, uh, that music was uh, that you just heard was actually uh, not Lawrence of Arabia or Star Wars. It was actually a uh, a, a knockoff piece um, that is part of the YouTube royalty-free music that I could use. Uh, I know I got a black screen here, and I got to fix this. I don't want a black screen. We we actually saw what I wanted to show you before, which was this, which is the uh, beautiful uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. And now I want to take us back and uh, grab something else. I get talking, and I forget to. I forget we're actually streaming something live here. Time to look, you know. So that's that's me sometimes. I actually want to make uh, sure the music's not too too loud. Someone just said it's a little hard to hear us. Yeah, and that's probably my fault too, because I, uh, I did change the uh, sound levels before. I'm gonna take us up. I wanna take us up to uh, this beautiful star here in Orion, and see uh, what it looks like. I wanna find out if we can actually gonna pull this out here. There we go. All right, so now we're gonna move up a little bit, and we get this and I'm, I'm going to show you what we're going to do with this um i think if you remember i told you that uh there was a way that we can actually um uh we can actually determine the color of the stars right now this star looks like it's like kind of white right but let's do something let's uh let's reduce the iso here the sensitivity to say 5000 and let's go back to our telescope control and let's turn off the tracking okay that means the star is going to drift across the field because the telescope is no longer going to track see there goes the star let's take a picture here we go 15 seconds at 5000 it's a drift photo and i want to show you something okay so as when this photo comes back we're going to see 
uh, a very interesting image. And it will tell us something about what we see in the image. And there we go. So this tells us now that this star is sort of an orangey star. This star is sort of a blue star. And then we see fainter stars. And if you notice, this star is sort of reddish, as this is. And this one's sort of yellow. So we're seeing star colors. And we can't see star colors uh, with our eye unless they're very, very uh, bright stars. So when we look at this star, we can see its color as sort of an orangey uh, color. And that's Betelgeuse uh, in Orion. It's the biggest and brightest star. We're actually right at the edge of the dome. You see this little line? The dome is actually uh, uh, causing uh, this, this to be a, a problem, which is expected. I kind of expected it because the constellations still move and the dome isn't at the point at this point. And the telescope's following the star, so it also drifts down, but the, the dome doesn't change. But look at how many different colors there are. There's really no color in here that's, that is identical to any other. You know, they're all different. You know, welcome to the world of the stars. So let's go back to here. And let's turn back on our tracking. All right, there's our tracking light. We're all set. Let's go back toward the west now. All right. Okay, and now, uh, as I said, uh, we do have to probably move the dome so that we can see uh, better because we're going to be digging into some of the galaxies and so forth in Leo and then in Virgo and we're going to want to be able to uh, do that. Um, Hold on, can you go back to your last picture? We have a few questions. Uh, sure. This one? What's the... It must be. Okay, hold on. Um, what's the black triangle pointer in the left side? What's the shadow to the left of Betelgeuse? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this is, see, the uh, the dome is is. Uh, if you look on the uh, here, the picture here, the the uh, dome cam, you can see that the telescope is half over the you know looking out of the slit and half looking at the dome, which explains why we see you know, a little bit of red here. Okay, it corresponds to the right side that the dome is seeing of the dome, uh, you know, the right side of the telescope seeing of the dome. Okay, and this sharp artifact here is a result of the sharp edge here on the dome that, that you're looking at. And I don't, I don't mean like there in particular, I mean, uh, in particular, what I mean is when we're looking at this right here, um, this right here is the sharp edge we're seeing. Okay. It's a diffraction effect, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's just an effect. Uh, it's an artifact because there's a sharp line going down through the through the uh, telescope at that point of, of the uh, uh, dome. So it starts right here below the hand here. If I go onto it, it disappears because it's actually a separate window that I'm adding into this. So right here it starts and goes down, and we actually see the effect of that here. It creates this strange triangular uh, uh, view. Um, but that'll, uh, I think that's pretty cool. Um, it's neat. Uh, now, the other thing, too, is... Oh, sorry to disappoint, guys, but it was a good catch. It was a good catch, yeah. Um, and as always, we always... That. Yep, we always look for satellites and stuff as well. Uh, and I encourage you to look for satellites as well. And, and sometimes they cross in the live view. <clears throat> and sometimes they uh, cross in the photo. So this is Betelgeuse here. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna run out and move the dome uh, so we can actually do this. I I'm, I'm almost done with the dome movement uh, circuits, so I'll be able to move the dome. Uh, and it's a sort of a throwaway circuit because uh, I'm gonna be going to a roll-off roof observatory where I won't need a dome that has a shutter that opens up and then has to rotate around. It's just a roof that rolls off the building and then rolls back on. Uh, at the conclusion of the night uh, so that's unfortunately that's uh, that's kind of where we're gonna be heading with that that makes the most sense um, all right so um, I will be right back and I think you and uh, Daryl can 
manage the uh, manage here, correct? Well, we're about to find out. You can. Oh yeah. Uh, actually, might... there's a question or two coming in. Maybe Daryl okay. can handle them until you're gone. Uh, that one by uh, uh, David Schmidt. Yes. But the uh, spectre. Yeah, uh, David. It depends if it's an emission or an absorption spectra. Uh, if it's an absorption spectra, that spectral line will appear dark. If it's an emission spectra, that line will appear bright. And he's asking, uh, at the risk of oversimplifying, when one runs out of spectrograph on a star's light, the elements that are present in the star will be missing from the spectrograph's output, right? Yeah. So what? That's what he's talking about. Yeah, the dark yeah. lines. So what does that mean when well, a spectrograph okay. runs out? Well, what he means is um, if you take a spectrum of a star, right? I haven't gone out yet, but I will in a sec. When you uh, take when you take a spectrum, you got tempted of, with the question. Well, I did. I wanted you know because uh, you know David has been good to us. I like to you know uh, give him uh, answers if I can, and and Daryl's very good. Um, but when you take a spectrum of a star, you break it up into its component light, and everybody knows that that's you know red orange yellow green blue indigo and violet uh and if you know if you want to know the name it's roy g biv okay well anyway um that spectrum will be uh showing us uh, what the star is made of because in the center of the star it's millions of degrees in the outer atmosphere of a star it's only thousands or tens of thousands of degrees right so what that means is that that's actually a cooler gas on the outside of the star than what's inside. So as the hot radiation from inside the star heads out and gets out and starts passing through the star and, and finally leaves the star, as it's going through this 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 uh, cooler gas, the cooler gas is uh, the the the, uh, the cooler gas absorbs some of that energy. Okay, because it can't help it; it will. And when it absorbs some of that energy, um, in the spectrum of the star, you'll see these characteristic dark lines that appear. And for uh, certain elements, like hydrogen, oxygen, calcium, okay, the lines appear in the same exact spot. I mean, that's for every element. You, you can identify every element by where these lines appear, all right? And we now know, of course, that uh, through all kinds of atomic testing, that there are these discrete energy levels in an atom where, uh, you know, um, electrons can bounce and move into, for instance, um, when we're looking at even cooler gas, all right, like out in the nebula. Um, and so, uh, but in a star, okay, we're looking at plasma, okay, we're looking at, uh, you know, just uh, nuclei of hydrogen and so forth. And when they absorb energy, um, they produce these dark lines. And the dark lines are what we call absorption lines for the very reason, because they're absorbing some of the energy from inside the hot star. Now, um, when you have uh, a nebula, for instance, that has hot ultraviolet light from hot stars in the center, then it can cause the hydrogen gas, for instance, that's most prevalent around those stars and probably from which they've been formed to um, uh, to actually uh, absorb uh, some of that uh, you know energy and ionize the electrons you know get the electrons off the atom or ionize them and when the hydrogen gas which can exist as an atom in the very you know, in the in the regions of the nebulae uh, unlike in a star in a star then the electrons can jump off the atom and then and they spontaneously uh, recombine and the process is called recombination. And when they do that, there's these discrete energy levels in the atom that they can jump down to, like steps on a staircase. So if you are way up, ta way up high and far along on the staircase, you're way up high in the staircase, you've, get, you've, you've got a lot of energy. Uh, if you jump down to step number two, you know, not one, not three, but number two, Okay, then that's a certain energy transition from far out, you know, up the staircase down to stair number two. And that produces lines of a, a series of lines that we know in hydrogen, which are called the Balmer series. 
right? And they all end on step number two. Well, there's series that end on step number one and so forth. Okay, so you can see that you know, these are all very characteristic, well-known places where these lines will show up. All right, uh, and when those electrons come down to step two uh, from wherever they were, they give off light. And so that light is an emission, not absorption. The absorption is when uh, it's a cooler gas that's absorbing uh, the energy from a hotter gas behind it. Okay, and this is a nebula that has atoms that are absorbing and ionizing energy, okay, ionizing their atoms to uh, have the electrons jump off. And then when the electrons come back in, they give off light, all right? And that's that's what we call the H2 regions, the, the regions that look red characteristically, because <clears throat> more than half of the re more than half of the transitions uh, in hydrogen gas out in these nebulae is the transition down to step number two on the staircase. And that actually uh, produces that red light we see, okay? Now, there's a lot of other transitions, too, that are happening. You know, the electrons jumping to other levels, right? But going to step two is the by far the predominant one. So that's why we see the, the nebulas are red, okay? All right, so now I go out and I move the dome. And if you have more questions, I'll be happy to let Daryl answer them. I'll be right back. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, let's uh, just wait a second until Mark's actually gone before we take the next question. Okay. Just kidding, Mark. I don't know. You know uh, right. What Mark just said actually relates to something that uh, Steve asked earlier about stellar redshift. Uh, uh, Steve, stellar redshift uh, is generally recognized as a star is moving away from us, okay? And if the star was moving toward us, it would be blue shifted. But what they're looking for in that red shift or blue shift is those lines, those emission or absorption lines that uh, David was asking about. Uh, when the star is moving relative to us, those spectral lines get shifted one direction or the other. Uh, if the star is moving away from us, well, it's called a red shift, and those spectral lines are shifted toward the red. Uh, that basically is how they can tell which way a star is moving relative to us. And when you get into galactic redshifts and universal redshifts and stuff like that, it's a whole different deal. And also, for what Mark was saying, uh, you might remember if you ever took a, like a chemistry class or a science class in school, uh, the teacher at some point probably made you hold a little spoon or a little wire with some salt on it over a Bunsen burner. And it produced a very characteristic uh, shade of yellow. Uh, that's sodium. And if you've ever seen pictures of them shooting a big sodium laser out of a professional telescope, which they're using as an artificial gu uh, guide star, uh, that sodium laser is that very same exact color that you saw in the, in the uh, flame of the Bunsen burner back when you were in elementary or secondary school. Yeah. Exact same yellow color. I hope that makes sense. Well, I went to a Catholic elementary school. We didn't do things like that. Oh, I bet you did. I didn't. Surely, surely they taught science. Well, well, yeah, but I, I never had anything on a spoon over a Bunsen burner. You could try that yourself at home. Put a little salt in a at the very tip of a spoon or on like a paper clip or something and hold it in the flame of your lighter and you'll see it turn that characteristic yellow color from the sodium. And then what do I do with it? Uh, you live with it, I guess. <laughs> you know, you, you learn something. Uh, if you've ever it just seen... changes colors, it doesn't... Well, it shows the characteristic color of the sodium. I don't know, can't you do that with cooking? I suppose you could. Does it change the flavor of the salt? I must. Oh, uh... Can you still use it? Like, would you I, ever... I, well, I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, I suppose you could if you wanted to. That's a good question. 
If you've ever seen the time-lapse video of the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, I highly recommend it. It's a great video, great music. Uh, you will see them shooting a sodium laser out of one of the telescopes several times in the course of the video. Uh, a, it looks really cool, but B, it's got that very same color as your your uh, science experiment Ooh. in elementary school. And Mark's what are back. they... Why are they doing that? Just to teach you about uh, the spectrum. No, the laser. Oh, uh, it's used as an artificial guide star, so to speak, that they shoot this thing out into space, the laser, and they can evaluate the image on their uh, imaging equipment, their cameras, uh, which tells them what the atmosphere is doing uh, directly, you know, in line with the telescope. Uh, the optics on the telescope are adjustable on a very quick time scale. So when they look at that point of laser light up in the sky, they control the telescope optics to uh, bend, so to speak, to uh, help recollimate the mirror on the fly and give them uh, better imaging. You're talking about adaptive optics? Yes, adaptive box optics and an artificial guide star. Yep. So you're talking about burning salt. Oh, yes. Sodium. Sodium. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had a question earlier, and although it's too cold out right now, <laughs> Mark, uh, yeah. do insects ever get in the way? In the summer... Into the dome and the telescope? In the summer, I, I have my share of uh, wasp nests uh, to eradicate, you know, and relocate if I can. Um, but uh, usually uh, we're okay, you know? Usually we're okay, but they do. I mean, I get mosquitoes. When I was out there, there would be, there were always a problem, you know. But not anymore. They don't really bother me now because uh, it's winter. I get mosquitoes. I've had a skunk. I uh, was <laughs> uh, the skunk didn't get on the telescope, but uh, I learned to give him a wide berth. Uh -huh. Guy co comes around here and he acts like he owns the place. Well, the one that visited me uh, kind of did own the place in a sense. Uh, yeah. But I allowed him to, I allowed him to, because uh, he actually uh, we got along. And, uh, and he was I remember that he was your buddy. He was. He was hanging out with me like no tomorrow. It was a lot of uh, a lot of real weird soul searching I had to do to figure out how I was gonna how I was gonna let this skunk uh, coexist with me here in this. Uh, in the in the shop but you know what it was fine it was a really really uh, uh nice little animal and like i said i've never pet a skunk especially a wild one in my life but when he walked up to my feet you know, there's this thing the size of a big cat okay and he starts sniffing my feet and i had my garage open i was working on a, a, a an eight foot submarine model actually for the navy and i figured you know what <laughs> I'll just get sprayed because this is an this is an unbelievable opportunity. So I squatted down very slowly, and his tail was twitching, and I kept my eyes closed for a bit in case he was going to squirt me. Um, and he um, <laughs> he just stayed there, and he was looking at me and sniffing me, and he was very well kept. He wasn't ratty or any way. He didn't have mange. He looked, looked good. And so I just uh, I reached out and I just scratched him behind his head on his neck yeah, a little bit like scritch 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 and then I pulled my hand away slowly and the darn thing sat down on his haunches and I scratched him again and he laid on his side and it was like wow and I just started scratching his belly uh, I mean they have claws you know and I was being really careful because he could have just gone raw, raw, and then that's it and I'm out of going to the hospital to get maybe uh you know, uh, shots and stuff, who knew? But he seemed fine. Uh, he wasn't foaming at the mouth. He wasn't acting weird. He was just look, acting curious. So I scratched his belly, and next thing you know, friend for life, man. I, I, I got up, I was walking around, he'd follow me, and if I went faster than he could see me, he would make a little chirp, and he'd run to catch up to me. <laughs> it was so cool. Uh, and I thought to myself, oh, what did I do? <laughs> What have I done? <laughs> you know, but boy, he was such a, a cute little guy that I, I just 
I just couldn't be mean to him. And uh, so, you know, I uh, I was sitting home one time and 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 I noticed that uh, you know he had he was waiting for me outside of my garage door. So I opened the garage door and uh, he he was uh, right there. And he comes running into the shop like, well, it's about time kind of a thing, you know. And it was just amazing. So anyway, <clears throat> that was my skunk story. Then uh, somebody called animal control because they saw the skunk walk into my garage. And they thought, oh, no, there's a skunk in the garage. And they called the animal control guys who, one one guy in a pickup truck shows up wearing a, that white you know, suit. He's got a, a, a face plate so he doesn't get sprayed by a skunk. And he pulls out the snare, you know, the, on the on the pole that he's gonna wrap around the skunk's head or whatever to take him. He gets out of his truck. He looks at me at the end of my opening of my garage, and out waddles the skunk. And he just sits down on his haunches, right, left, right to my left, saying, "Hey, what you looking at, Dad?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm just gonna have the guy here who's supposed to here. He's coming here to get you, but I'm not gonna let him take you." And uh, the guy goes, "Don't move. The skunk's right next to you." And I'm like, I look at him, I look at the skunk, and I look at him, I look at the skunk, and I, I say to the skunk, you know, uh, some of us humans aren't too bright, just so you know. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know, yeah, I know, he's kind of my buddy, see, and I, I reached down, and by this point I was really comfortable with him, you know, I could almost be playful and move him around hand-to-hand -hand kind of a thing like you do with, uh, you know, uh, your cats if they're very friendly with you. Uh, and this was a... Uh, uh, something that this guy just couldn't handle. He lifts up that face shield and he goes, What the heck? I've never seen this before. I've been doing this for 20 years. I go, Yeah, this is just a very friendly skunk. He's my buddy, uh, but he'll be okay. We're, we're fine, thanks. And uh, he uh, he insisted that I get him out of the garage because he couldn't leave unless he did something. So I said, oh, Okay, you know what? Come on, skunky. And I, I patted his behind, you know, with a stick. You know, just gently come on we gotta go and he's like oh come on i don't want to go you can tell he's thinking that you know he wants to go back in the garage and i shoo him down the side of my yard where there's a big culvert and uh, other cover for him uh and of course <clears throat> what i have never said before is as soon as the animal control guy left of course skunky came back and uh we continued our fun little uh, friendship but then he disappeared for uh like six weeks this is Regulus, by the way, the uh, brightest star in the constellation Leo, just so you know. We'll take a uh, photo of it just to get an idea. 5,000 for 15 seconds. Um, <clears throat> and well, he disappeared for like six weeks, maybe more. And I had almost forgotten about him when I was coming home from someplace one night. And the outside light went on just as I came up the driveway. And I'm thinking, huh, that outside light shouldn't have seen me uh, so quickly. I wonder what that was. And I got up there, and it was because something moved. And that something was skunky. He was waiting for me at the base of my walkway where I walk into the house. Uh, and I was like, I got out of the car, cautious, because I wasn't sure it was him. You know, they all do look the same. And I said, skunky, is that you? And when he heard my voice, he was like going, oi, oi, oi. and he comes running right up to me, and I just freeze, thinking, okay, if this isn't my skunk, Okay, this is going to be a bad scene. But he runs up to me, starts running between my legs and, and rubbing up me like a freaking cat. Okay, and I squat down and I start manhandling him a little. Hey, Skunky, it's you. How you doing? And he's all excited and agitated. And I'm thinking, wow, what's going on? You okay? I haven't seen you for a while. Over to my right, I saw something catch my eye in the darkness. When I looked up, I saw several more pairs of eyes. <laughs> Okay, one big pair of eyes and a bunch of small pairs of eyes. And it's his family. He actually, you know, he was a mate with family. And I was like, you brought your family. Oh, they look just like you, you know. And, and, and the female. <laughs> the, the, I'm sorry. That's fine. That's no, fine. The female was actually uh, really, really unhappy that dad was over there fraternizing with those humans. Okay. Uh, and uh, but it was really kind of uh, it was sort of a beautiful moment, and I said, "Oh, I'm so proud of you uh, that they're beautiful." 
And as if on cue, I said, well, you know, you, you better take them and go, go back down in the ditch there. I think that's a better place for you guys. Uh, and as if he understood me, I'm sure it wasn't. You know, he went back to his mate, and they gave the car a wide berth. Went around the car, crossed the lawn. Actually, right where the observatory is, they crossed the lawn right there, went down into the thicket uh, next to the house. <clears throat> and uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, they disappeared, and I didn't see Skunky anymore. Uh, but every now and then, I smell his offspring down there and say, oh, Skunky's you know, there in, in memory, I'll tell you. You know, memory only, but he's there. So really, well, how long do skunks live? I, I think they live a few years. You know, just. Oh. Well, I, I, bet I thought you're... if they if they didn't get like hit by a car or like eaten or anything. Yeah, there's not many uh, predatory animals that go after skunks. Mm. Um, I bet you're a legend to the skunks, Mark. <laughs> In the skunk community, <laughs> yes. Yeah. He is hail the almighty guy in the house, you know. Yes, the weird one with the goatee. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, we've said before. I think animals can tell when people have a good heart. Oh, I think that's true. I think it's very true. Yeah. I, I've I've never had a problem. Animals are, are like, I, and I've told you guys this, and I don't know how much Daryl has heard, Amanda, but you know, you've heard all those stories. You know, I I was. Out I love the skunk story. You know, the, the skunk was like the the, uh, you know the uh, the culmination of of my Doctor Doolittle, uh, you know things, but I'll tell you this. Um, you know, I was out changing the spark plugs in my truck one day, and I felt somebody tapping on my shoulder, and I thought maybe it was, you know, one of my kids or whatever. And I turned to my right, and there's a bird, a blue jay, on my shoulder, and it leans over looking at me like, hello. <laughs> He's looking right in my face, and I got real, oh, I backed up my head because I thought he could peck me in the eye. You know, we well, didn't. He jumped down to the plywood that I had open the top of the truck so I could actually lay down without, you know, getting, getting, uh, you know, all crunched up in the engine. Um, and he's watching what I'm doing. And he's like, you know, walking over, jumping on my arm, jumping down on the plywood, and then just started looking at me. And I'm like, well, hey there, Jay, how you doing? I call him JJ. Um, very creative. You're so creative with your names. <laughs> and then JJ uh, gets back up on my shoulder, and I get off the truck because, of course, I now have this blue jay that I have to pay attention to. You know, it's a living thing. I'll pay attention to that before I'll, you know, pay attention to a spark plug, for crying out loud. And I start talking to JJ, and I take him off my shoulder with my finger. He just had no problem going to my finger. And I'm looking at him, and I'm talking to him, saying, hey, JJ, how are you? You're a beautiful bird. You're beautiful blue, and you're white underneath here, and you have a good grip, you know. Uh, and he was very, uh, very, uh, you know, nice. And so I let him go. I, I, I put him on the truck and let him just hang out there while I did the spark plugs. And then when I was done, I told him I gotta close the hood. It's gonna be loud. And so I closed the hood, and he flapped a little bit, but he didn't fly away. And then uh, I went inside. And uh, I came back out later on, and he was nowhere to be seen. So I figured, wow, that was a weird thing. As soon as I work, um, as I'm walking down to, uh, to cross over to my barn, little uh, shed, <coughs> out of the corner of my eye, I see this thing flying toward me. And it's JJ. He's going, and boom, he lands right on my shoulder. <laughs> I'm like, wow. It, it, it's like, it, it was so quick to imprint on this uh, little creature. It was amazing. So I talked to him, and he spent about, uh, I'd say, two weeks with me. And the guy that worked for me in my shop at the time didn't believe a word I was telling, like I'm telling all of you. So I said to him one time, all right, you know what? Come on, let's go outside. We left the shop, went outside. I'm calling for JJ. JJ, JJ, where are you? And as I'm uh, getting a little dejected that I don't see him, uh, all of a sudden, this kid Matt sees JJ flying toward us. He goes, "Is that it? Is that him?" And I look, yeah, that's him. He's coming toward me, but he stops dead in the air. If you can imagine a, a bird doing it, they stop dead and flap their wings. You know, he saw Matt there, and he's like, "Oh no, I don't know that human." And he he landed on a post uh, some distance away. And so I said, "Okay, wait here." And I walked over to JJ. He didn't fly. I said, "Hey, JJ." I reached out my hand. He hopped on my finger. Okay, and I said, hey, this, see, this is JJ, okay? And I walked over and said, it's okay, this is Matt. 
He's not going to hurt you. You're with me. Don't worry. I'll protect you. <laughs> yeah, I was kidding. And so I, uh, I said, hold out your finger. And I moved JJ close. And, and JJ was cautious, but he stepped onto Matt's hand into his finger. And he's gripping his fingers. And Matt's going, I don't believe it. This is a bird on my fingers. I go, yeah, that, that's how it works. You know, uh, the bird is just uh, a bird's, uh, I don't know why, he imprinted on me. Well, anyway, um, needless to say, I took him back, and I started feeding JJ stuff and like that. And then next thing you know, uh, he was emptying the uh, bird feeder left and right, uh, which is fine, no problem. And uh, then after like three weeks, he was he was gone, never saw him again. Um, so I figured, wow, okay, this, this neighborhood's full of really cool creatures, great and small. Uh, and then one day... Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm sitting uh, in, in the uh, front of the house. Uh, actually, I'm in the doorway, and it was a screen that was there. And this fox walks right up on my front porch. A fox. They're very timid. Uh, and he just comes up to the screen, and he sees me sitting there, and I'm figuring uh, he's probably going to just say, whoa, human, and run away. He didn't. He looked at me, and he started making this noise, like, ah! And then he's like holding up his paws, like, and, and pawing at the screen. He wanted to come in, and he looked like he had a lot of mange. You know, he was really, he was unfortunate. I said, "Oh, you poor thing, you need to be helped." So, uh, he, uh, you know, I, I opened the door and I didn't let him in. I walked outside, and he stayed ahead of me about five feet, looking behind every like two seconds, uh, and I followed him out onto the lawn. And I went to my, went back into my house to grab a have a heart trap. I said, I'm going to capture you and, you know, um, and then uh, I'll bring you to a wildlife rehabilitator that I know. Uh, so I got the trap, I set it on the lawn, and I, I set the trigger. And I said, oh, I need to get bait. I'm going to get some peanut butter. I said, don't go away, little guy. Don't go away. Um, I'm going I'm to take care of him. I'm going to help you. As I'm walking back to the house, you know, literally 50 feet away, uh, is all it is. I, I, I probably take four to five steps, and I hear ka-chink. I go, what? Oh, I said, I was thinking in my head, oh, it fell, the trigger fell. I turned around, astonished, the, the fox is in the trap. He's just sitting in the have a heart, very calm, kind of, you know, you know kind of too too small for him a little bit. Uh, and his, his fur was sticking out of the sides, and I went, oh, no. I said, come on. I'm glad you did this because I'm going to take care of you. We're going to get you taken care of, okay? You'll feel a whole lot better after we're done. So I brought him in the house, opened the cage, and I, I dropped him into a box. Not dropped, but I turned it on edge so he could slide out into a box, which he did. And he could have run away, but he didn't. He didn't even do it. He just stayed in the box looking at me. Uh, and I said, can you just wait right here? I'm going to go get you something to eat. And I went upstairs. Now, the fox could have jumped out and run and hid in my basement anywhere. There's plenty of places to go. He stayed right there. I came down with some peanut butter. I came down with some Hamburg. Okay. And he voraciously ate all of it. You know. <laughs> and they're cute when they eat. They look like cats when they eat. You know, <laughs> So cute. Uh, and so <laughs> what I did was I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I just decided, you know what? Again, once in a lifetime, like the skunk. You know, and if he bites me, he bites me. So I reach over and I said, I gotta check you. I gotta check this this matted fur. I think it's 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 mange. So I'm, I'm, I reach over and I start to stroke his fur, and he his nose comes right up to my fingers. I'm, and I just like, okay, I stop. I let him sniff, and I could feel a little cold nose sniffing my, you know, touching my fingers. It was hilarious. Um, he didn't bite. He just let me do it. And I said, okay. Let me see here. And I start to move the fur. And I said, oh, yeah, that looks like it hurts. Okay. And he cried out a little bit. I was like, oh, that does hurt. Okay. Uh, so I got on the phone to uh, Veronica, the wildlife rehab person I know. Uh, she unfortunately passed away. But uh, I said, uh, Veronica, I've got a fox here. Um, and uh, he needs some attention. Oh, can you bring him down tomorrow? I said, yes, I can. Uh, and so... Uh, I stayed down in the basement with the fox for about another hour. And I ended up taking him out of the box and had him in my lap. 
And the little guy curled up and went to sleep in my lap. I was like, oh, this is just so nice. I don't want to move. <laughs> I don't want to move. Uh, but I, I kind of moved him back into the box. And he woke up. But then I put him on his little blanket in the, in the box. And he curled up fast asleep. And I said, I'm going to leave the, the box open. Okay. Uh, just so you know, you can move around. All right. If you got to go to the bathroom, if you got to get out and go, I understand. I'm not going to be mad at you, little guy. And I'm stroking him on the head. You know, like... And he, he's, he's literally acting like a dog or a cat who's actually liking it. Uh, so I go upstairs, wash my hands and so forth really, really well. Um, and I go to bed and I wake up the next morning, come downstairs, take my shower even, and come downstairs thinking, all right, I'll have to go hunt down the fox. He's probably somewhere hiding in the basement. Nope. He was sitting in the box waiting for me to come down. Uh, and when I got down there, I was like, hey, let's go get that taken care of today, okay? We're going to take you over to Veronica. And uh, I, I picked him up in the box, and I walked him down the driveway and went across the street because that's where she lived. Uh, oh, I got this. Oh, what a beautiful fox. Yeah, he's definitely got mange. Yeah, you were right to get him taken care of, and he's probably so uncomfortable. Uh, so she had him for about two weeks, I'd say, maybe a little longer. Uh, and she got rid of his mange. She made him, you know, she you know, fed him and did all the things that were necessary gave him medication uh, and, and and so forth and she ended up uh, uh, releasing him you know farther away uh, and didn't tell me and I was like oh Veronica I wanted to go with you oh it's okay probably best that you didn't because you know he's imprinted on you and he just want to follow you back okay well, where'd you release him well about two miles away okay so anyway uh, I get up you know several mornings later maybe four or five mornings later and I hear what sounds like a baby crying. I mean, a baby, holy cow. So I, I rush to the front porch, I look down at the sound, and it's the fox. He's back, and he looked beautiful. His fur was just so shiny and beautiful. You know, she did a great job, and it was him. Okay, I could tell it was him. Um, I said, Foxy! <laughs> That's what I called him. Of uh, course he did. Yeah, and of course, right? So creative, <laughs> so creative. And then, uh, so I got out, I went down the front and I went down into the yard and Foxy's there. He's laying on his side now and I'm, I'm scratching his side saying, Hey, Foxy looks so good. Look at you. Wow. What a beautiful animal you are. Not once did I take a picture. You know, I was just so taken by the fact that these, this little guy was here and you know, I, it's not like he was coming back to thank me or anything like that. Maybe he had that that instinct in his head perhaps in some way uh comfort but i see when you drive an animal like far away like that you're taking him from his foraging route where he goes for food they're they're habitual creatures they will go to the same place over and over uh you know same place to get water same place to find mice and and food you know um and when you take him away from that then that's more damaging than um anything else so he found his way back you know, and, and got back on his route. And they lived a lot longer. And up till uh, just a, about four months ago, I was running my security cameras outside at night, and they were triggered by something that went through the, uh, the field of view. I look in there, and it's Foxy. <laughs> he was in the yard again. So I was like, ah, he's still around. And he's still around now, I'm sure. Uh, and I, I mean, I just, I feel comfortable when he's around, you know. Um, but the coyotes, I haven't made friends with any of the coyotes yet. They they run in packs, and they're a lot more aggressive and uh, difficult. Uh, and I'm not trying to make friends with them, believe me. Um, anyway, so that's that's the uh, the uh, skunk, the uh, blue jay, and the fox story. Um, uh, tune in for more next time. Well, I don't even know. I don't have. Do I have any more animal stories? I don't know if I do. I don't know. But I, I can tell you that. Um, um, I, I just, you know, I just was taken aback by how how these creatures are so, so beautiful. Anyway, uh, we've been doing a whole lot of nothing here astronomically, so uh, you're here not to hear about foxes. You're here to see some astronomy. So uh, let me go. I have a, I have the telescope pointed up uh, toward uh, Leo, and and it's not like, and it wasn't like I was wasting time. Actually, I had to. Uh, I had to sit back and let, um, I had to let the uh, telescope 
uh, acclimate to that uh, upper position because I noticed that there was uh, ice on the inside of the dome. So, yeah, it's not on the lens, though, on the corrector plate. Um, so I figured I'd let it sit for a little while longer because when you move it into the wind, kind of like it is now, um, if anything's going to happen to it, it's going to happen now. So I figured I'd let it get it. So I'll see it in the first photo, and then we'll know whether we can continue or not. Okay, but while we're here, we have M95 and M96. We looked at these yesterday, I believe. Okay, M95 here is uh, 32 million light years away. And M96, I'm not sure if we have a distance on M96. We do. It's 31 million light years away. So, you know, M95 is uh, 32. M96 is 31 million light years. So they're kind of neighbors in space, relatively. Uh, but let's go check them out, shall we? I think it'll be kind of fun. So we're going to go check those guys out. And we're going to uh, see if these are going to come. I just got an alert on my phone that says the, the security camera in the dome noticed movement, which means the telescope is moving. So I'm expecting that it did, and I think it did. Okay. So let's do a, a 4K video uh, mode for a moment. And let's bring this up to say, here we go, yeah. 51,200, 64,000, okay, 80,000. We can see over here, actually you can't because dome ops is in the way. Uh, let's just go up a little. Okay, this is the world of galaxies. So here, we see one here. Uh, we see one here. Um, and I bet you that's M95 and M96. So let's bring this up a little higher. Right there. And that should put them fairly well in the frame. But I'm going to bring us over, go eastward a little. All right. Okay. Now I think we can drop it back down and go go check it out at a say 16,000 for 15 seconds, shall we? And see what we get. My sister had a fox that uh She's like you, I think, you know, good heart, whatever, and animals knew that. Uh, every dog in the neighborhood would come visit her, and she always had treats for them. Wow. Uh, other critters, uh, this fox started coming around, and he was a little shy at first, but yeah. uh, he got used to her, and maybe he just figured she was an easy mark, but she fed him hot dogs every time he came to the door. Oh. So he became part of her daily route, you know, that, uh, hey, That's it's right. hot dog time. Let's go see sis. That's right. Uh, it's pretty funny. They're pretty canny animals, too. They are. Uh, they are. When I, when I worked up at the mine, uh, there was a whole family of foxes that uh, lived right behind the infirmary there, the little mini hospital right on the mine site. Uh, okay. And uh, I was there one night uh, <laughs> uh, due to an injury, and hanging out with the nurses all night was easy money, and uh, they had dinner, and then they opened the back door, and all the foxes came to the back door, and they <laughs> were feeding them all sorts of God. Uh, uh, zingers, you remember Zingers from Hostess Cakes? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, they were feeding them zingers and sandwiches and potato chips and all sorts of stuff. Uh, uh, they were pretty tame, but they would not come inside. And they would not let you touch them. But uh, otherwise, they were there every night. Wow. Well, you know, um, I guess different foxes, um, different foxes are, di are different around other people, you know. I, I know that my fox was probably in pain um, and maybe... It was a desperation move because maybe he observed something that made him think that humans would help him. Uh, and he picked me. Uh, and I'll tell you, it was the best feeling in the world to see him healthy again. 
Sure. Uh, I just and, and his tail. That's the thing I, I couldn't get over. His tail seemed ratty before. Um, but once he he had the mange removed and and treated for the mange and had a bath, okay, uh, and the the uh, the folks that gave him the bath, his color was a beautiful red, right, with some brown. And he was just gorgeous. I mean, the tail was so big and bushy. It was amazing. And that's what struck me. And and the tail is the same way on the uh, security cam that we caught. I actually have that uh, that security cam footage uh, stored on the computer here somewhere. Uh, I kept him. I get rid of a lot of the other stuff. But, yeah, it's uh, really, really impressive. I'm very happy there to is, see uh... I'm sorry. There's sure. a spectrum there. Uh, uh, I think it can be dangerous sometimes to anthropomorphize uh, animals, you know, give them human characteristics. It's absolutely dangerous. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, this is how people who go to Yellowstone, you know, they yeah. they try to dress up a bear cub in their kids' clothes or stupid stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, then Mama Bear shows up. Mama Bear's not amused. Mm-hmm. But animals no uh i don't know i'm always reminded of uh at work years and years ago a very old buck deer started hanging around the front door or the back door at work okay and he was a pitiful old thing uh one antler was broken and the other one was uh just hanging there and it had turned black Hmm. and he was just a real sad sight to see but he kept hanging around the doors and people would uh, go out the back door at break time, go out and sit yep. on the patio, and he would just stay right there and look at us, and he wouldn't move a bit. Uh, it was like he wanted something, you know, where he was looking for something or needed something. And yeah. uh, the poor thing, you know, he was there for three or four days, and then, uh, oh, the first snowstorm of the season blew in, and the last we ever saw him, he was standing out on the corner facing into that storm blowing into his face like you know well here it comes again yeah and we never saw it again <coughs> i wish you know it'd be nice if i could have done something for him but there's pretty strict rules out here about inter- interacting with wildlife yeah yeah for uh, sure. and he disappeared and i'm sure he became coyote food sooner or later but it was mm-hmm. you know kind of sad uh, the way it all happened yeah i i don't i don't mess with any uh, large creatures i mean i i I, uh the i didn't have it hasn't been all fun and games here i mean i actually when my when my black lab pit bull shepherd mix was uh young and puppy as a puppy i let her out at 2 a.m uh down here to go to the bathroom and i went out with her and she smelled something on the front lawn. She went bolting right past me back into the house. And I felt like the spongy ground shaking. And I heard, <laughs> as something was running toward me. Uh, and I went, oh, okay, I'm getting out of here. And I ran back in the house, slammed the door, just in time to hear something smash up against the door, heavy, and rub the door. You know, <laughs> something was rubbing against the door. I was like, what the heck is that? So I literally waited an hour, and I, I opened the door a little bit, and had this god awful stench, uh, you know, and you know, and Is it a bear. Yeah, it was actually a, a black bear, uh, and wow. the reason the reason I know that, okay, was because uh, the next day when Matt, the kid that had worked for me that time, came over, I told him the story, and he goes, "Oh, I forgot to tell you." I said, "What'd you forget to tell me, Matt?" He goes. When I left your house yesterday, there were two bear cubs playing on your front lawn. Oh, my gosh. You forgot to tell me that, Matt. You forgot to tell me that, Matt. I grabbed them. I picked them up. I jacked them up. I said, I met Mom. (laughs) You know, uh, this is a pre-observatory, too. So I was out there just to let the dog out, you know. Uh, But, man, that was just frightening. 15 seconds at 16,000 for this trio of galaxies all in short order here. Yeah, it was frightening, you know, because uh, I just, I didn't know what to make of this, you know? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't want to try to make friends with the bear. Oh, I, I was perfectly happy not to. Here's our galaxies right there. I'm going to raise them up. 
a little bit. We used to get bears at work sometimes too, and uh, oh, they'd cruise by the the back door and the front door and the north side of the building, and uh, yeah. you know they're looking for food because that's what bears do. Uh. Uh, and I'm sure the smell of uh, probably the garbage in the trash cans uh, out on the patio probably drew them also. Yeah. Uh, we had one bear uh, at work. Uh, well, it was uh, a short half block or less than wor from work. Uh, the bear came up the creek, uh, you know, as bears okay. do or animals do. The deer came up the creek also. There was a creek right behind work. And uh, some lady was out walking. And she came face to face with the bear. Yeah. And she, she freaked out. She did exactly the wrong thing. She run. ran. Yeah. You don't run. And the bear started following her just out of curiosity, I guess. And the woman was pregnant, too. Uh, oh. Well, guess what happened? Mr. Bear, uh, he, he didn't survive. I mean, she freaked out and they called the cops and animal control and they came out and euthanized the bear. Yeah. Which is sad. Yeah, because... Uh, you know, they were here before we were. Yeah. Uh, yep. So it goes. Uh, Cosmic is asking about Spectra, and, and uh, I'm just going to say to him tonight, hey, we actually have a spectral system. I've been actually testing it, and um, last night and the night before, it was actually hooked up, um, and uh, but I just didn't get to do some spectra <clears throat> i really enjoy the spectra because <clears throat> then we can actually see uh these dark lines in the star spectrum that i tell you about uh i just have a couple of little um uh, problems with the spectral system i'm trying to get uh what's called a live view so i can actually see live the spectra in the camera um and I have the control system. It'll show up here in the screen in place of this. It'll show, uh, I'll see, you know, the spectra on the screen. And uh, it really looks beautiful. But the trouble is I have to see that live view so I can focus it and critically focus it. Um, they need to be critically focused. And the way a spectra are taken, like say we're doing a spectrum of this galaxy, okay, we actually will have this up, all right, and we'll actually turn off tracking and will allow the, the galaxy to start to drift toward the west. And while it's drifting to the west, we'll actually record the image. And that will actually give us a uh, thicker, wider spectrum so that we can see the lines more easily uh, that may be in the spectrum. Um, and in the galaxy, we, we see different types of things than we see with a star. But it's still... Um, you know, possible. There's certain galaxies that have emission lines in them. Um, the Orion Nebula, for instance, it, it, it shows emission in the oxygen and in the hydrogen region. So we have the O3, the doubly ionized oxygen, and we have the H2, which these are all Roman numerals, O3 and you know, H2. Uh, in the H2 of the Orion Nebula, that's singly ionized hydrogen. Um, and for those wondering why we don't say uh, H1 is singly ionized hydrogen. Well, the Roman numeral 1 for any atom means its base state, where it has a neutral charge, you know, as many protons as electrons. No electrons are being uh, knocked off. If the hydrogen atom loses an electron, it gets ionized. Okay, that's uh, singly ionized. So it goes from H1, H Roman numeral 1, to H Roman numeral 2. Uh, which is the uh, singly ionized state. So that's how that works. So H1 and, and, and that Roman numeral 1 on any atom means the base state. Okay, so it always becomes, when it's ionized, it's minimal uh, ion, uh, ionization of, of Roman numeral 2 and up. See? So that's how that works. And uh, so uh, I will hook the... Uh, uh, I'll get it working, Cosmic. It, it, it does work. The only problem is I have to just get that live view operational. And to do it, I need to uh, hardwire the power into the camera uh, out there. And when I do that, uh, then I won't have any problem getting my live view because uh, it's actually battery sensitive. And right now I have a battery on it. And uh, if the battery is anything less than 100%, uh, 
uh, then the live view doesn't want to work. And uh, so I just have to make sure that it has that, that power. And making a circuit for a camera is not, not a big deal. You know, I can, you know, uh, make the casing, you know, the battery itself. I can make a battery shape uh, with the contacts and everything to go in there. Uh, and I just have to have wires coming out of the bottom so that they can, uh, uh, you know, do the uh, uh, send power in. And then I just have a power supply on the telescope, which will send uh, power up constantly uh, to the camera. It's not a big deal. Um, I just have to make it. And, you know, in the winter when it's freezing cold, uh, you can't work outside for long periods of time. So I have to do it inside my shop. Uh, and I, I have two big Navy contracts to do right now. And so uh, I can't get to much of anything when it comes to working on a telescope uh, other than what I've got. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, that's how this works. Uh, and just so you know, the, these galaxies that we're looking at here, uh, we went, I went to just a little while ago. Um, and just want to share with you uh, what they are. These are, uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, we, it's M105 here. M105 is the galaxy in the upper, uh, in a, on the right side of the two that we saw, and it's uh, 31 million light years away. And then uh, we have NGC 3399, okay, and, sorry, 3389, and that's uh, a galaxy that's 80 million light years away. And then we have this galaxy, NGC 3384, which is 26 million light years away and we go back to our image here okay we can see that okay this is the furthest galaxy so it does look a little fainter doesn't it um, now what's funny is all galaxies that we look at like this they all have a value called the redshift uh, and the redshift is a parameter that was discovered uh, gosh back in I think the 20s was it Edwin Hubble right um, and discovered uh, that the redshift is a value that tells us the distance to the galaxy based on the speed at which it's receding from us, you know, heading away. Um, a very interesting finding. Um, and we talked about the expanding universe before, and Amanda did a beautiful uh, analogy based on something I had talked about, about the expansion of the universe. Do you remember that, Amanda? I think you the do. Balloon, yes. Yeah. Well, describe that if you would, if you if you could. While I'm working on a couple things here. Yeah. Well, it was uh, Mark's analogy, but it was something I could actually do practically. So, uh, what you do is uh, take a just a balloon before it's inflated and draw some dots on it, and you can see how close the dots are to each other. But then, as you start filling the balloon and expanding it, all the dots seem to, well, not seem to, they do, all expand in each different direction away from each other. Which is odd, isn't it? When you think about it, you know, that we essentially, uh, everything in the universe, unless it's something local to us that we're gravitationally interacting with, is, is leaving our area. It's racing away from us no matter which direction we look. And that was confounding us for a long time, but then we realized that it's like we're on the surface of a balloon, okay? Every other, every spot on the surface of a balloon, no matter which spot you pick, every other spot will seem like it's racing away from you on the surface of a balloon as the balloon expands. And that analogy applies for the uh, expanding universe. Uh, the only thing that's weird about our expanding universe is that... Uh, we've discovered that the universe is actually accelerating uh, its expansion. It's not just expanding and slowing down, as you might expect. It's actually accelerating. Uh, and that acceleration of expansion, you know, faster and faster every time, tells us that there's something else at play here. Clearly, if the universe was expanding... Uh, then it would start off with the most energy it would have. And then that energy wanes, and it would slow down in expansion, especially if it's gravitationally 
you know, expanding from the center, right? So you would expect that gravity would tend to slow it all down and bring it in to crash again. Um, and that's kind of what people thought, and that's that led to the oscillating universe theory, where you, or the universe would expand and contract, expand and contract, countless times through all eternity. Well, that's not exactly, not exactly what's uh, being observed. What's actually being observed? That picture didn't work. I'm gonna do it again. What's being observed is that the the expansion of the universe is getting faster and faster all the time, and that makes no sense. So they figured out that maybe it means that if that finding is actually correct, then it means that outside of our known universe, there is a force that's actually pulling the outer part of the universe, the outer boundary of the universe, outward more. Okay, I gotta get this to just take a correct picture. We're waiting for that thing to calm down. Uh, so, what would that mean? What What does it mean uh, 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 that there's something outside the universe? Well, what they thought is maybe we're actually looking at dark energy. And you've heard of dark matter. It's not the same as dark energy. Dark energy is is a strange form of energy. It's, uh, it's Think of it as like negative mass. <laughs> okay? It's an odd construct. But it's a construct that tells us uh, a little bit about uh, this this supposed energy that's outside our universe. Maybe what's happening is our universe is acceler accelerating outward because something outside is attracting it outward. Imagine a balloon being placed into a vacuum chamber. As you evacuate the air in the vacuum chamber around the balloon, the balloon's going to grow in size and expand because now it's not being, the outer surface, the outer walls aren't being pushed on by air. There's vacuum. And the balloon can just expand and expand and expand, and that's just what happens sometimes. So that that finding is the kind of thing that uh, it, 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 that might explain what's going on. Yeah, uh, and so it, you know, it's it's not a uh, it's not a uh, it's not set in stone, but it's something that is a very possible finding now. Um, that the dark energy was used as an explanation because in, in absence of anything else. But it, there might be other uh, explanations, in fact. Uh, and there's ongoing research to try and answer that ultimate question. Um, but anyway, these are the three galaxies now we talked about, and now I've got them placed in here. Uh, do either of you guys have any questions? Because I was going to uh, move us on to something Oh, God, don't get me started. <laughs> uh, I was a big believer in the oscillating universe, okay? And then all this stuff about dark matter and dark energy yes. came out. And I just, uh, I have a hard time accepting it. I know, you know, people talk about dark matter. And golly, you know, where's the dark matter? And it's, they're just placeholders. They're, they've given them a name just, you know, to try to pin down what they're seeing. Yeah. Uh, I yeah, used to be right. able to talk cosmology with the best of them, and I, I pretty much refuse to talk cosmology anymore. It's just, it, it's past me. I feel like one of the old Hoyle steady state guys nowadays compared to the modern state of, uh, you know, modern cosmology yeah. now. I feel like a dinosaur. Well, not really. I mean, <sighs> if you think of, uh, if you think about it, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, a uh, bunch of theories in, in, for all, all of you listening. There was a, there were theories in the past that said that the universe is what it is. It hasn't changed. It's immutable. Nothing's changing. Uh, and that was the steady state theory where nothing was changing. Did a lot of people believe that one? Sure. Everybody believed that at one time, yes. Yeah. And then... That nothing was changing in the universe? Meaning... The universe was infinite and it was unchanging. Right. Uh, that, that was that, originally what, what it was. That's steady state. A guy named Hoyle was a big proponent of that, yes. which is why I mentioned his name. Uh, uh, but, and then, uh, well, who discovered the expanding universe in the first place? Was that Hubble too? Yeah, I mean, remember the uh, the, the the expansion uh, was found uh, was through the redshifts, actually. Yes. Uh, and that redshift is the shift toward the red end of the spectrum of these distant galaxies' uh, light. 
Um, and the shift is greater the, the farther away, meaning it's faster. The, the, it's called the recessional velocity is faster. Um, believe it or not, I've actually always had trouble with that. I think that there's something else in between us and those galaxies, which is actually reddening the light. Uh, I'm not necessarily thinking that that's, uh, you know, because of the, the, the this recessional velocity is a, a true thing. I know it is a, a true thing. I actually calculated it. I used it a lot. But I think that there's other other uh, physics. In we know now that in between galaxies where we used to think there was nothing, we know there is something. Um, and in fact, there's lots of gas in between galaxies that has previously been unseen. And we notice yes. it. We notice it because we look at the difference in arrival time of these pulses that we get from these bursts that approach the Earth. Uh, we see that the light, the, the red light, takes a little bit different time to get here than the blue light. And what that does is it tells us something about uh, what slowed down that light. Uh, it's something in between the galaxies that actually slowed down this light. You know, and that gives allows us to uh, map the intergalactic gas that's out there because we don't have a way to see it otherwise uh and when we have these bursts we actually can map it um so that's giving us a hint that there's something else at play and i predict there is uh more at play than uh, meets the eye here you know but that's just me and that's, hold on yeah i'm so lost okay say what what's hoyle's theory again the that's universe steady. is infinite but stationary infinite. Uh, steady, no, state. steady, steady, infinite, state, steady, infinite, steady. Yeah, things can move in the universe with no problem. They can move around in the steady state theory, but, but the universe itself. But the universe itself isn't expanding or contracting. It's just, it's there. It's an inflated balloon and it hasn't stopped. You know, it's not. But it's not going anywhere. Isn't that? Isn't that the opposite of infinite, though? Does an infinite uh, itself mean keep going? Yes. Forever? Well, it means endless, yes. Uh, uh, there's a concept called finite yet unbounded, uh, which is how they used to explain this. Imagine you were an ant and you put it on a basketball, okay? Uh, and that ant decides to go for a walk. Well, it's never going to come to the edge of the basketball. It's just going to keep going around and around the basketball. Yeah. Uh, you have to up that one more dimension, so to speak, uh, to see the basketball is finite. It is not infinite. It only has a surface area of a basketball, but it's <laughs> unbounded because there's no edge or no end to it. So that ant's just going to keep doing laps on that basketball, oh, you know, okay. for all time. Uh, it is finite, yet it is unbounded. And the same thing, I don't know if it's still said or not, uh, but uh, the same thing was said about our universe, that it was finite, not infinite, but it had no boundary. There was no edge to the universe. And that's where the old saying comes that, well, if, if you headed off in one direction in space, eventually you'd run back into yourself from uh, the back. You know, yeah. uh, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that's sort of the idea that you wouldn't see that you were moving in a curve, but eventually the, the curve of the universe, you know, you would come back and run into yourself. Uh, uh, there is a... Another analogy to the balloon with the dots on it, it's called the raisin bread analogy, which is like taking that balloon from two dimensions to three dimensions. Uh, imagine you make a nice loaf of bread and you stick it full of raisins because you're making raisin bread. Well, you let that loaf rise, or when you bake it, the loaf expands, and those raisins inside that loaf, the farther apart they are to begin with, the faster they're going to be moving away from each other. Is that the hamburger, Mark? Mm-hmm. It is. That's a... <laughs> Speaking of raisin bran. Hey. Bread. I will Sorry. gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Oh, that's a wimpy thing to say. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I think I'm going like to make it. raisin bread this uh, morning. Let's see that. Sounds Maybe like I'll film it and use it as a sky tour analogy. That's a good idea. Sure. <laughs> yep. yeah, does this that is... make sense, Amanda? Yes, it does. 
Yeah. I love so, your analogies. Oh, I might. I, Marks are uh, good too, but sometimes some of the terms go over my head. I like if you make raisin bread. Okay, I can handle yeah. that. I didn't think that up. Somebody, somebody a long time ago thought that up. I'm just <laughs> quoting them. Yes, that was the Hamburger Galaxy, which is NGC uh, 3628, uh, New General Catalog Entry 3628. Uh, and it shows like this really small ellipse here, but the fact is it's actually fairly large. Uh, and so I think that's just uh, the nature of how they're showing it. You know, they don't show it looking very large, but there it is. Uh, it looks beautiful. Actually, I think it looks a little better than last night when we looked at it, don't you think? Oh, uh, comparable. I, well, I think I missed it when you looked at the hamburger last night. I wasn't here yet. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, we looked at it Monday night, though, and yeah, it's uh, comparable. Okay. Well, I think it's a little better tonight, but I want to take us down to here, uh, and we can take a look at these other two in the Leo triplet. And these are just going to basically be right down below. So we shall see them. Mark, one other thing about the recessional velocities and galactic redshift and stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, wasn't that Hubble that figured that out? And isn't that called the Hubble constant? That the when they observe galaxies, they appear to fall on a curve pretty cleanly. That you know, the greater the distance, the faster they're moving. Yeah, the, the Hubble constant um, is something we it, actually you use the Hubble constant to calculate redshift. Um, but the Hubble constant is a um, not necessarily a constant. Unfortunately, there there's been some some work that indicates that maybe the Hubble constant needs some uh, refinement itself. Hmm. Yeah, and if you look that up, you'll see what I mean. Uh, but you know what? That's okay because the bottom line is we're not ready to go out there yet. You know, we still have to basically work on technologies at home. Uh, we'll we'll be able to figure out the galaxy and make sure that Einstein was right uh, later on. Uh, but right now we gotta mine the moon. We have to uh, get to Mars, install Amanda's blanket. Uh, okay and get it to uh, be uh, uh, terraformed. Okay, I'm, I'm wondering why my... I have a question. Okay. And it's a theoretical question. Sure. Um, okay, remember, I think it was last night, uh, we were talking about the ISS, and I think you said it went like 175,000 miles. 17,500. The okay, speed, the speed sorry. in orbit, yeah, that's no, okay. I'm not good with numbers. Um, okay. And I made a joke about, oh, that's about as fast as I drive. And you're like, yeah, never right. If, and I know it's not possible, but if you could actually move a car that fast on Earth, would you see the redshift? Would you physically see the red and blue from the mo motion or still no? Um... Is there anything that could ever go that fast where we'd actually see the light, the movement? No, the light is shift? so so much faster that you would never ever see that. Would you have to be moving at the speed of light to see it? Well, if if you were or faster. This this is a tricky question because it has to do with something called reference frames. Uh, but uh oh, uh, <laughs> I saw that coming. I'm yeah. sorry. No, it's all right. A <laughs> man. Amanda, remember the last time we talked about reference frames? I don't. She doesn't remember. I probably not. There's, that's a lot of information, and it a is. lot of the times it's the first time I'm hearing it. So, um, uh, it was the night I tried to tell you about relativity, and if you were riding on a train or if you were standing on the uh, standing on the platform next to the train watching you go by. Uh, that's all the different reference frames. It went downhill pretty badly. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's Carry funny. Well, let's try it again. Now that you tried it once, let's try it again a second time because I have to hear these things a few times and get piece by piece. So let's try it again. If you don't oh. mind, Mark, or is this like, is this just a train wreck waiting to happen? Oh, no. I, I just think that 
I think that if you phrase the question correctly, or or, or in a in a way that handles the the uh, that uh, provides an answer that's bite sized, then you could you could understand it in little pieces, and then put them to pieces, put the pieces together. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to phrase it properly. So, how fast would you have to be going to physically see the red and blue shifts? Faster well, than the speed of light? No, well, no. Yeah. See, here's what, here's. Let me just explain what your what the red and blue shifts. Okay. Uh, red shifted light is something that can be detected at a huge variety of speed differences. Okay. Blue shifted light, same way. Uh, for instance, a star that's got a planet around it is wobbling in its orbit slightly. You know, it, it actually orbits, the, the planet orbits the star, and it tugs on the star. And the star moves a little bit toward the planet as the planet's going around it. The overall result is that the star travels in a tiny little circle itself. You know, where that circle it never amounts to anything great. It's, it's only always within the star itself. By a great margin but that tiny movement toward the earth maybe and away from the earth provides a red shift and a blue shift that we can measure that's called radial velocity uh, or, or it gives us radial velocity and the radial velocity tells us uh, where um, or how fast the star is moving toward us and how fast it may be moving away from us those numbers are never near the speed of light they're like a few kilometers per second you know, uh, and and so that said, um, th because there are just a few kilometers per second, you can see that we can get redshift and blue shift at uh, very low values. You know, and that's what we—that's what this is. You know. May May I say, uh, Amanda, you might remember uh, when we were talking about riding on a train versus standing on the platform watching the train go by. That uh, sounds we, familiar. Yes, we changed it to an airplane, and there was a clock on the airplane, just like there was a clock inside the train. Okay. Uh, we can easily, if you take two identical clocks, put one, you know, standing in the airport, and you put one on the airplane, and that airplane takes off and flies away, uh, if you had a magic view that you could look at the clock on the plane and the clock on the in the airport, you could see that the clock on the airplane is running s slower than the clock in the airport. Uh, this is another aspect of relativity, but it's again the reference frame thing. If you were on the airplane, the clock would appear to be running at normal speed. If you were in the airport and you could magically see that clock in the airplane, you would see, compared to the clock you're standing next to in the airport, that the clock in the airplane is running slower. Why? Because I'm closer to the one I'm standing by? No. Uh, because and further away from the airport it's, plane one? Because it's moving faster. Yeah. And uh, it, it's time dilation, I guess you would say. Yes. Uh, the faster, this is caused the deal by where, uh, movement caused by near acceleration the speed of light. or speed. Yeah. Uh, this is why uh, they say if you ever moved at speed of light, uh, you would not notice passage of time. Like if you were on the sun and you flew to Earth, it should take you eight minutes, but if you were in a magic spaceship going the speed of light, no time would pass. You'd be bang on the sun, then you'd be bang on the earth. Get it? Dead that's silence. Crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> well, let's see, that's, yeah, that's... I love this kind of stuff, though. I do. I do. It hurts my head a little, but I, I absolutely love this kind of stuff because... I don't, and this uh, makes sense to you guys? Yeah, actually. <laughs> this is so crazy. Oh my god. I know, gosh. I know. But, uh, Daryl, you said something earlier that I just have to uh, kind of add a little caveat. Uh, remember sure. when the uh, fast radio bursts were coming in, uh, the signal has what's called a dispersion associated with it. And that dispersion has to do with the time at which the red light for instance gets here uh, before the blue light or ahead of the blue light um, and so the dispersion is caused by the material in between galaxies that the light pulse is passing through and it okay. can actually retard 
certain frequencies of that light train. So, whereas, yes, light travels 186,282 miles per second in a vacuum, but it doesn't travel at that speed if it's going through different medium. It's going to actually change. So if that medium is gas, intergalactic gas, then certain frequencies can be affected by that. And that gives us a dispersion that tells us how far away these bursts are. That's how we actually figure it out because of the fact that the frequencies are shifting. You see what I mean? I understand. Yeah, and, and so and if you look that up, look up dispersion and fast radio burst, and you'll actually see, and this is for all of you too, uh, you'll actually see uh, that the light, train coming from these fast radio bursts is indeed affected by the stuff between galaxies and again that's how we're mapping it that's that's giving us clues to what we thought was nothing it turns out that there's vast tails of gas uh, between galaxies connecting the galaxies and so forth and that's uh, kind of a new finding you know now here's the other thing too when we talk about uh, dark matter and dark energy before Let's look at dark matter for, for, for once. Okay, let, the, let's use these two galaxies right here, okay, as an indicator. Uh, I think we're looking at what, M105? Uh, no, not M105. This is uh, M65 and 66. Yeah, M65 and 66, sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, this is 65, this is 66. Okay, in between these galaxies, which are roughly the same distance from us, we think there's emptiness here. These stars we see are in our own galaxy. They're, they're only a few, uh, I don't know what the distances are, but they're probably, you know, just a few hundred light years or so from us, uh, maybe. And these are millions upon, tens of millions of light years. These galaxies are tens of millions of light years beyond those stars. But in between, if we got out of the stars here, got out of our galaxy, we would just see this galaxy here, nothing apparently, and then this galaxy here. In reality... There might be a vast uh, gas cloud that's enveloping these galaxies, and if a fa uh, see, and if a fast radio burst came from say this galaxy, and the the gas cloud was in front of it and over this galaxy, then that that light would pass through that galaxy. I'm sorry, that 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 uh, gas cloud before coming to us, and when it did that. Its frequencies, the, the, the color frequent, the colors inside that would be changed. The, the frequencies would be changed a little bit. There'd be a a, a a change made to the frequencies such that the light won't all arrive at the same time. And that's the problem. That's the dispersion we're talking about. And the different dispersions tell us how far away these fast radio bursts are, uh, in part. And so that's something that's I think a a fascinating study to do because most people would say that the speed of light is X and it doesn't change. But if you remember, it's always the speed of light in a vacuum. In a vacuum. And we've learned that in between galaxies it's, it's not a full vacuum. We have material right. there. And so it does alter and it changes the frequencies. Um, I, I just think that it's important to understand that. Uh, but again, look up fast radio bursts for all of you. Fast radio bursts. Uh, and uh, if you do, actually, they'll tell you about dispersion. It's D-I-S-P-E-R-S-I-O-N. Uh, dispersion and fast radio bursts. And you'll you'll see all that. You're not, not going to get these big fancy papers. You'll actually get stuff that can you know, be understood. You know, uh, And I think that'd be pretty uh, cool to do. May I say... Uh, uh, what you just said is sort of a caveat to the question I answered for D. Smith a while ago. Uh, he asked if different colors of light move at different speeds. Uh, the caveat, I said, well, they all move at the speed of light, of course. Uh, and what you said, you know, modifies that. But uh, the, the big point is uh, what I said should have been implied and not said was in a vacuum. Yeah, that's okay. Um, and that, that's all the only thing I was uh, just adding to that. Right. But it was a, it was a very good answer and a, and a good discussion. Listen. Yes. I'm still on the plane thing. Couldn't, uh. couldn't, no, couldn't you actually do that though? Because what if, say it didn't interfere with the plane or whatever, 
couldn't I actually put a physical clock on a wall, or not a wall, but like, put a physical clock on a plane where everyone could see it, and then like, Skype someone on land and look at their clock? Couldn't we actually prove this? Or, or because the laptop with Skype is still technically on the plane, it wouldn't work. I'm trying to figure out why... Like, I understand... Well, no, I kind of don't. Like, uh, the plane well, is moving, therefore the time is adjusted, but I still don't understand why. I think maybe uh, you doing that on Skype would be equivalent to the Magic Viewer I talked about earlier. Uh, I believe they've actually done this, I think. Mark could probably say. Uh, they have taken very accurate atomic clocks. Uh, they keep one on the ground. They're, they're synchronized before they do anything, so they're reading yeah. the exact same time. Uh, they'll put one on an airplane and fly that airplane around the world or not even that far and bring it back, and those two clocks are no longer in agreement because yes. the clock on the airplane has been uh, running slow because it's moving faster. The faster you go, the slower the time goes. That's right, and that's why um, that's why it's been said that astronauts on the ISS, even though they're they're moving seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour, and not near the speed of light, uh, they age differently than when they age on the ground. Yeah, I know they did that twin experiment. Well, I mean, but I think that would have been off anyway because they were both astronauts and both of them had spent time in space. Yes. So I think it would have been altered from the very get-go, but... And it's not its not that I'm disagreeing. I, like, I understand, in theory, the yep. faster something goes, the slower time moves. Yes. But there's still a why I want to ask after that. Like, I'm still not getting why that is true. Okay. I well. guess, I guess we'll, we'll leave it for an off-air discussion, because I'm sure a lot of people are getting it, and don't want to hear me or, ramble by or not i mean that's okay May well okay maybe i don't know i'm not I don't gonna know because you guys are giving good explanations it's just it's good that you're asked uh yeah. it's you're still trying to get your head around it i am that's all. yep and and i mean that's better than you not guys trying. have studied this for years and years and i'm just trying to get a grasp on the basics now so it's gonna sure. it's gonna be a while but the more i hear it you know yeah, Again, well, I'm I'm up I'm up to that point now. You might remember this phrase from our earlier discussion. Sometimes you have to take it on faith. No, I know, I know, and that's what I mean. It's not that I'm disagreeing or trying to disprove or argue yeah, or anything I, like that. It's I I hate that phrase. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. No one. Take we, it on faith. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, I I was told that so many times when you know, going through quantum mechanics and stuff like that. I was like, ugh. I do no, not I mean, want to take sure it on faith. I'm sure they've done a million tests. I'm sure it's all accurate. I'm sure, like, you know, to be sending people out into space, yeah, I'm sure it's down to a pretty exact science. It's not that I'm questioning that. It's just, <clears throat> why does it work out that way? Like, I understand. Because it does. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, that's the, that, that's the answer I don't like. And right. Well, I mean, they uh, relativity has been through many tests, and it has yeah. passed everyone with flying colors. I know. I know. Uh, so when you have a hy of, uh, yeah, when you have a hypothesis, the idea is uh, when you have a hypothesis, you want to uh, test it, and it's very important to test the hypothesis. Yeah, know? but see, even if I did that thing with Skype, even if it worked, yeah, I still wouldn't know why it was working. I still wouldn't know why, like, you know what I mean? Even if I could prove it myself, Yeah. not that I'm doubting it, it's just... Yeah. Oh, wait till I talk to you about Peter Beckman and his uh, ether theory uh, oh, yeah. of the speed of light. I've threatened Mark with that a time or two. Yeah. Uh, it's supposedly actually a self-consistent scientific theory, and he rather neatly explains away relativity. It goes over my head, but uh, uh, Peter Beckman says that, uh, or said, he's passed away now, uh, said that basically the uh, 
the local gravitational field is the ether that like Michelson and Morley went out looking for. People used to believe in the ether as this magic uh, fabric of space. And he says he said that uh, the local gravitational field is the equivalent of the ether. And uh, he said that the speed of light is actually not constant. That what we see as the speed of light is just because we're looking at it from inside our gravity well. If we were to go someplace else, we would see the speed of light could be different. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter Beckman was a professor emeritus in electrical engineering at the University of Colorado, so it's not like he was a crackpot. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but people see, tend but to. But that makes more sense. No, could be. Like I mean, because I mean, you can even use that for the far side of the moon being a dark side. Well, it's not dark because. It's only because it's tidally locked that we can't see the other side. Right. But that's, that's, the sun is still lighting it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. We just can't see it. So that's I right. can see, you know, light moves a certain way from our perspective. But if you looked at it from somewhere else. <clears throat> yeah. It would be different. See, that makes more sense. So, well, okay. So what am I missing with the plane theory or the train theory? It's the same uh, well, thing because you're just looking at it. No, but it can't be because it works in the real world too. Because, it, like, say, say if I'm going to to New York in May, like, it if you watched my plane leave Sydney to go to Halifax, would you see the plane in the air longer than me myself being on the plane would actually be in the air? Uh, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, you know what, I was letting... I just assume you guys can... I was letting you, uh, in Amanda talk here, I'm trying to get the Silver Street Galaxy in. I mean, I did, okay. I, I had it, I was just trying to do this, so... Uh, uh, Amanda, if I understood your question about you on the plane versus me watching your plane... Yes. Uh, would I see the plane take longer to go from Sydney to Halifax? Yes. Is that your question? I think so. Uh, yeah, I mean, the difference would be min the difference would be minuscule, but yes. Uh, but uh, say, like, if you watch for an hour and I'm actually in the air for 58 minutes, probably less than that, but you know what I mean. Uh, the min I there would be a difference. Time. It would be minimal. I'm not sure it would even be measurable. Uh, but this goes back to like the atomic clock on the airplane compared to the one on the ground. Uh, you know, you could put a clock on your airplane and a clock on the ground, and if the clocks are accurate enough, you probably could measure the difference. Would I see the difference? No. But uh, those two atomic but clocks, would you would there. see a difference. I'm but sorry. it would still be there. It would have yeah. to be there. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Okay, hey, that's... that's <laughs> that's the part I'm missing how does it apply to the real world that's why I, I don't do well with theory I have to get it to the real world because in sure. theory that's fine you know the two clocks read differently why how does that work in the real world okay uh, so you might not technically be able to see it with the naked eye but that makes more sense to me it would be a shorter trip in the plane than if someone was watching stationary on the ground the whole trip in the air uh very very slightly yes it would be a shorter time for you uh but that's how the theory would play out in real well, world again right? they have done this in the real world they they put atomic clocks on airplanes and you know uh synchronize them with one on the ground and when the airplane lands they compare the two clocks again and they no longer match mm -hmm. because time slowed down on the airplane that's right. Uh, this gets complicated, though, and I'm about to start tripping over my tongue, just like the last time we did this. So, uh, I think I'm going to leave it where it is, unless you really insist. I won't insist. <laughs> You're funny. Well, <laughs> what, you don't believe me? No, no, no. I do. I'm actually uh, I'm being preoccupied by the sound of 
uh, a rodent in my wall. I have to. It's oh, no. an unfortunate occurrence that seems to occur here uh, now and then, um, and I can feel him. Uh, I can hear him chewing on something. Probably the cable television uh, cord, which is no longer functional. Um, Otherwise, if it was electrical, well, then we might lose power <laughs> uh, and then smell burning rodent, but um, not not looking forward to that. So I'm kind of uh, preoccupied with that because it's really loud. It's, a, it's like knocking on the door behind me, so it's probably something big. Uh, I found a rat in the wall, and, uh, you know, that's what happens when you live out in the country. So I'm just looking at different things. I want to... I actually want to go to uh, something else here, and uh, this is the guy, I think. This is the one that we were looking at yesterday, and I want to check it out again. It's called the Kick the Can Cluster. <laughs> it's also known as NGC 4147, and this is a request from the chat. We have another request from chat. Maureen's requesting you get a cat. <laughs> and I think that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, except that I can't put the cat into the walls. Oh, well, no. You're not supposed to put a cat in the wall. Oh, well, you're not? Maybe you're you shouldn't cat. get a cat. No. <laughs> I'm kidding, she tells me that all the time, too, Mark. Okay. You would love a cat, Daryl. Oh, I'm sure. Better I would. yet, a cat would love you. I've been I'm historically sure. allergic to cats. Um, yeah. But you know what? I'll tell you the truth. Uh, back when I was in college, I had we had a cat in the house we lived in. Uh, I lived with a bunch of guys and and male and female. We were a co-ed house, and we're all friends. And um, we had a cat, and the cat was named Gherkin, uh, like the pickle. And uh, I remember Gherkin would actually sleep with me at night sometimes. And I couldn't believe it, but Gherkin was very, uh, <laughs> I hate to say it this way, he's filthy. He didn't wash. Oh. Uh, and so I tended to, like, you know, try and keep him kicked off the bed. Uh, and so Gherkin ended up... Uh, Gherkin ended up being uh, a cat that I was not allergic to. Like, literally the one and only one. Yeah, and I think it's because I wasn't getting... You know, he wasn't... Uh, he wasn't cleaning himself. You know? And that's why. Really odd. You know? Really they are. say cats are always drawn the strongest to the people who dislike them the most. Yeah, well, I guess so. <laughs> hey, Cosmic, uh, thank you for coming for the ride. Um, hey, Cosmic, thanks for dropping by. Crackle, See crackle, you, crackle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we will see you next time, Cosmic. Thanks for coming by. Excuse me for just a second, please. I'll be right back. Okay. Sure. All right, I'm waiting for the telescope to settle out. And then we're going to do 20 seconds to 20,000 on the kick the can cluster, which is a globular cluster. That must have been discovered in the 50s. Ha, uh -huh. kick the can, remember that? No. <laughs> oh, then why'd you say that? Well, I never played, but. I didn't either. I the game. Okay. I never played either. I think, didn't they play that in one of the Twilight Zone episodes where all the old people went back to being young again? I remember that. Yes. I think they were playing Kick the Can in that. Yep. Okay. I'm That's gonna... probably where I know it from. Maybe so. Maybe so. All right. We're going to, uh, we're going to bring, we're going to bring this, uh, cluster which is right about here we're gonna bring it up to about here so that means a little bit like this and a little more maybe a little more 
All right, we'll try that. And here we go. We're going to get to kick the can cluster one more time. Again, I want to thank you guys for coming along and hanging out with us tonight. You know, there's around 39 of you watching right now, and uh, we're having a good time. I know that not many are participating in the chat, but that's okay. But I still want to go through and just say, you know, Dave Schmidt was here, you, Amanda, and we have, uh, uh, is that a T-O-L or D-O-I? I can't tell. Uh, oh, Doll I. Doll I. Okay, Doll I. Good. And Jay Parker. MTX is here. Quintus and Steve Evans was here. Those are the people that were active in the chat. Uh, although we know that Ronald from Earth Radio has been here. Uh, so I don't know why he's not showing up when, in fact, he's made yeah, fairly regular contributions. D. Smith has been here, but why D. Smith's not showing up? I can't imagine. Um, it's just... Maureen. Yeah, that's right. She's here. Laura was here. Uh, Bim Jim was here. Bim Jim was here, yeah. And even, There's a whole bunch of people. Yeah, um, so I, I'm not sure uh, what's going on. I think on John there. was here earlier, weird guy. Yep, um, he was. Mm -hmm. Maddie was here. Yep. We have him. No Life was here. Franco. Okay. Alright, so now let's get to... Go there and... There Two W was here. Yep. Jamie Judd. So there's the Kick the Can cluster. Um, it's a really interesting globular because it looks like it has sort of like a ring of outer stars on it, but it doesn't really. It's just that those are, uh, it's just the way the cluster looks. It's, it's, it's sort of an illusion, I think. Um, and uh, let me just go see if I can go uh, in and here. Hike. Tim's in here. Tim's in there. You gotta too. be you gotta be active in the chat if you want to shout out. I'm not sure why some of the names weren't showing up though. There yeah. were a lot that didn't show up, but Yeah, I don't I don't get why that happens. And that, you know, guys, I'm sorry about that. I, we it's, try. It's not If my, we missed you, we're not sorry. My fault. <laughs> it's Amanda's fault. <laughs> it is. Yes, no, it is not. I'm not no, sure. I just I just checked my list too, and a whole bunch of people were missing off my list, so but that's okay. I mean, uh, some people just are here for the views and uh, listen to music in the background, and yeah, some people are just here for the chat and the conversation. And yep. if a show happens to be on, that's okay. <laughs> and you, you, you know, know what? all sorts of different reasons to come. So yeah, just be comfortable. We don't bite hard. Oh, good one. <sighs> so this is the kick the can cluster. This is a really interesting uh, global cluster. It's actually. Uh, it's it's like uh oh gosh wow it's how many uh, is it 60 it's, it's actually uh it's labeled as a global cluster but it's actually uh if if it's right it says it's like 60 light years away which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me it should be a lot farther than that uh so i'm gonna have to check that out uh there's i've found data in this planetarium program that's been wrong before actually um uh does the kick the can cluster have a different name it's ngc 4147 ngc 4147 yeah yeah check it out and see if you can get a distance to the kick the can cluster oh okay oh you don't have it there well it shows 60 light years which i don't believe okay. no Maureen was looking for it too so okay it's not the alternate name yeah I mean if it's a globular cluster if it's truly a globular cluster um, for uh, if it's a globular cluster that's only 60 light years away it's that's what it say what's that uh, 60 K L Y 19 oh, okay 63 thousand light years now that makes right. sense it's actually labeled wrong in stellarium see folks this says 60.0 ly that should say kly yeah so okay good we found an error nice you want to know something i learned yesterday i think 
What's that? Yes. Reading about M87, they were talking about globular clusters in M87. Uh, how many globular clusters does the Milky Way have? It's like a couple of hundred, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, they're halo objects. The, yeah, uh, M87 has, I think they said, 16,000 globular clusters in it. Well, I mean, M87 is one of the most massive uh, galaxies. Right, so we know that it's a. Uh, we're talking oh, yeah. about the, the Virgo galaxy. That, that's that's huge. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's again, our galaxy is reasonable size. It's not the biggest galaxy there is by far. I mean, even the Andromeda galaxy has close to a trillion stars, compared to our hundred billion to even in the outside four hundred billion at the most. Uh, we can't even count the stars within our own galaxy, actually. Uh, these are all just estimates, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, but that's the way it goes, you know. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know what to tell you. You know, I got to uh, bring back my red lights. That was my, uh, when my lights start to change color, that's a, a timed thing, which tells me that um, the uh, that 12.30 is approaching, because at 12.30, I actually turn, the, the lights are programmed to turn off. So they change color back to white, and then they fade to uh, to be off. But we've been going for, you know, this is, this is just over three hours, so uh, I'm comfortable with uh, calling it here, because I have to be up early tomorrow morning. Uh, and be somewhere by 9 a.m. So at 12:30, not not bad. Um, so let me see if we've got one more object. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on that note. And on that note, let's see if we got one more object. Um, Make a mental note of the time. One last object. Uh, let's yeah. see how long it actually goes. Yeah. Well, it it. I say just shy of an hour. It can't go that long. I have to uh, do something here. Um, yeah, I know. I just want to. Uh, well, fun. it's your excitement for this that brings people look at back. This. Look at look at all these galaxies. Holy cow! It's like, yeah, how do you stop looking? I mean, you gotta keep looking and figure these things. Look at them. Really cool. I mean, you know, this this chain here of galaxies, Markarian's chain. This is uh, an incredible number of galaxies, right there. Are those the eyes? Uh, actually, uh, where are the eyes? Yes, right here. See? So we're going to actually uh, go to Markarian's chain. Let's do that. And so as we move over, we're zipping along. Motion was detected in the observatory. Therefore, I know that we are moving. Every once in a while, you'll see a little red flash. That's actually uh, one of the pixels in the camera sensor um, going off. Unfortunately, it's not, you know, a UFO or something like that. Okay, let's do 20 seconds at 20,000, and let's see if we can, first of all, get a good shot. I mean, I have to uh, recalibrate the telescope anyway. And I said correct for the periodic error correction uh, as well. Hey, NYC. Was that the thing you were supposed to do? Yeah, I haven't done it yet. It's, it's like, <laughs> it was like two degrees. Um, it is Mark Yeah, Harry NYC King. wants to know if you can see Alpha Centauri. Yeah, Alpha, Alpha Centauri is a, a, a southern star. Um, it's below our horizon, not by a whole lot, believe it or not, but it is below our horizon, so we can't see it, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, uh, and I can't say that in time we will, because we won't. Uh, but I know that, <clears throat> depending on where I set up the observatory in Arizona, uh, we might be able to see Omega Centauri, which is a beautiful globular cluster. Uh, Daryl knows about Omega Centauri. He was talking about it the other night. Oh, yeah. It's oh, a yeah. stunning globular cluster okay, uh, when I saw it it was as big as a full moon in the sky 
Yeah. And it was millions of stars all piled together like you poured sugar on a black tablecloth. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was just uh, one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Oh, I, look it's forward a to seeing it. I look forward to seeing it sometime. So this is Markarian's chain. These are the eyes over here. That's uh, the nemesis of Daryl Mason. That's a spot on my corrector plate that has to be uh, taken off. I'm not sure I'll be able to get it off, though. I actually scoured it pretty good the other day. I, I don't mean scoured it with, like, a sandpaper or something. I mean, just tried to uh, clean it the other day. And I have alcohol wipes and gauze pads. And I do one wipe, and then that's it, you know? Uh, but Is it on the outer surface or the inner surface? Uh, well, I actually, yes, it's on the outer surface. But I do have some uh, on the inner surface, which... I'm a little more hesitant to clean, but I'm going to. Uh, I've I've taken uh, the corrector plate out actually and cleaned. Uh, yeah. You know, and I just, you know, that that's pretty easy. That doesn't matter. You know, you can put the, if you put it back exactly as you took it out. You're very close to the same collimation level. Everything's the same. Yeah. But, uh, a couple of things you might try. Uh, uh... I remember the president of the local astronomy club, uh, he admitted once that he just used Windex to clean his corrector plate. Not a good idea. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good idea, though, because uh, the Windex can affect plastic. It actually fogs plastic very easily. Yes. Yes, it does. And the ammonia in it does. Yes, it's not a good idea. Uh, uh, if I was to try that, I would... Uh, I would make a weak solution with Dawn dish soap and uh, hot, clean water, maybe even distilled water. Yeah. Uh, Dawn dish soap was always my uh, cleaner of choice for doing laser optics. Uh-huh. That stuff would take off everything. And then, you know, you just rinse it thoroughly, and uh, uh, I would generally just blow them off with air. Yeah, well, uh, I have plenty of Dawn, uh, but the trouble is that uh, when we... The, the part you said about rinsing off thoroughly. Uh, it's not like you can rinse thoroughly unless you use some kind of an alcohol solution, um, you know, and then, and yes, then wipe. Yes. And I've used alcohol to remove water from optics also. Yeah. Okay, so here, here's where we are. We're actually looking at Markarian's chain here. Uh, let me just pop back here to the shot to show you what we're talking about. Uh, and I'll do that like this. All right, so now uh, you can see these two galaxies over here. Okay, we see two bright ones right here. We see a faint one right there. Okay, so let's see. We have two, one and one, and a faint one. So let's go back to uh, our Stellarium. All right, and we see that we have two. One bright one, and one bright one, and the faint one. Right now, there's also two more down below, all right, and another one right here. So we should see one, two, three more. Now our exposure was only uh, 20 seconds, so we might not uh, be able to see it. Uh, it. We might not be able to see them. But I'm going to go back to our our view here, uh, and let's do that. Let's take a look. Uh, I think we see one right here. Right, and we should see another one in here, and it might be there, but I'm not sure. We should see another another three right here, no? Uh, but we we do see the eyes. We see these two, and that one. Uh, really cool. Uh, very cool. Uh, what what's Amanda, what do you mean, MUFON updates? Oh, sorry, talking about Art Radio. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was plugging when Erica's on, you know, Eric. Oh, okay, yeah. Eric uh, Hartford? No. No. Hartog. Hartwig. Hartwig. Ah, uh, sorry, Eric. Oh, such a sweet guy. I don't think he was here yeah, tonight. Yeah, he's the uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Is that, is that American road I'll word? just stop yes. talking now. No, no, no. You're you're from Canada. Yeah. It's not like you know our states. I mean, that, that's it's odd to hear you say it incorrectly because those of us in America 
in the United States would, would say, how could anyone get the states wrong? Well, if you don't live in the United States, you could get it wrong easily. Massachusetts? Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, if you don't live in the states, you can get it wrong easily. And that's, you know, it's not part of your daily life. So it's okay. <laughs> and there's no judgments here. Anyway, this is Markarian's chain here, and uh, which includes this uh, other pair of galaxies right here called the eyes, uh, which are kind of cool. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is uh, say that uh, it's, it's hard for me because I don't want to, but I have to say good night. Um, and uh, at 9 a.m. tomorrow, uh, I have to be out the door uh, for a doctor's appointment. Uh, and you know, I have to check it out. And uh, nothing too serious, I hope. No, everyone, no. please send your thoughts and prayers and good no. wishes to Mark. No need, I'll be fine. Well, you know, the drive is more dangerous than the appointment. <laughs> no, I'll be careful on that too. Then there you go. Well, it's been fun. I think we. I think people really enjoyed your stories about the skunks and foxes and JJ and... Yeah, well, you know, but this is, this is an astronomy thing, so I kind of wandered down that path. I agree. Um, yeah, but people like getting to know you, too, the man behind the telescope. Well, I'm right here. See, look, I'm waving. Hi. Hi. That's me waving right there. You know, I can say hi. I, I own the telescope. I, I, this is the warm room. It is warm. Yeah. Good. And D. Smith, thank you. All will go well. I'm fine. It's 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 uh my uh, it's just an annual uh, checkup, uh, but it's actually at a dermatology office for you know skin checks and stuff like that, because you know everybody should get them. I had a wicked bad sunburn as a kid, and uh, so uh, after getting a uh, one skin cancer potential object removed from my face uh, a while back. Uh, now I get these yearly updates and, and yearly checkups, and uh, they're always fine. Yeah. <laughs> Nine-year-old with NASA boxes is amazing. Yes, uh, it is. I, I felt so. As a kid, I was just made crazy by it. Wow, so cool. You know, very good. I think everyone secretly wants a NASA box now. People were asking earlier in chat, I wonder if they still do that for kids. I'm like, kids, screw kids. I wonder if I can get one. I, I actually saw that, that comment and I meant to <laughs> respond to it. Uh, NASA, has, it's, it's called an outreach program um, and it's public outreach. I don't know that you'd find the generosity that, no, I, don't think that so. is, that I experienced at a different time, <clears throat> you know. Uh, and maybe I was just a kid that struck a chord with this one particular scientist, you know, Gentry Lee. Uh, but I'll tell you this, um, uh, he is responsible for me being an astronomer. Uh, so everything that you're experiencing is due to uh, Gentry Lee. You know, too many times we just say, look what I've achieved, look what I can do. I think, yeah, but you know what, how many people's shoulders did you stand on to do that? Yep. You know? I've stood on the shoulders of giants. I'm not afraid to say it, and I'm usually abundant with the credit given away to other people that I owe it to. Um, sure, I have some talent, but you know what? <laughs> My talent comes at the, uh, you know, at the uh, 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 with the wherewithal of the others that came before me, and uh, I don't ever, you know, I don't ever take that in. Uh, you know, make these all claims about me. Look what I am. You know, it's like I am who I am based on my the sum of my experiences and the sum of the people that pushed me in different directions. And and that's really all you can ask of yourself is to just make sure you never lose that connection with where you were and how you got to where you are. Okay, that's uh, that's that is the little life lesson for tonight, grasshoppers. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> anyway. Mark, thank you for having me tonight, Amanda. Thank uh, you for joining us, Daryl. So I enjoyed it, Daryl. Always a pleasure. All right. Well, you guys uh, out in the chat, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we will be back on the next clear night. And if it's clear tomorrow, guess what that means? <laughs> 
Yeah, this is the and fourth night. And remember, especially to some new subscribers, <coughs> yes, hitting the subscription <coughs> bell is wonderful. Don't forget to hit, hit the bell beside it, though. That's how you know when we go live next time, because it's always fun. We we do go live. I mean, you can always catch them. They're always uploaded afterwards. But if you have questions for Mark, or if you have requests of objects you want to see in the sky, <coughs> come to the live shows. Hit that bell and come live, and uh, Absolutely. we'll do our best to, to bring it to you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we 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 went to several requested objects tonight too, and uh, ones that were up. You know, Cosmic asked us. He's gone now. He went to spend time with his family. But uh, uh, I kind of like that people choose to spend time with us in Skytour live stream. Uh, you know, and then say, "Well, I'm going to go spend time with my family." So it means that we were somewhat as important as their family. Yes. Which is kind of And nice. we're all kind of family here, too. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. I love this community. I love this chat room. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are very few mods in here, but we keep it safe in there. And uh, I well, think everyone in chat's very respectful. Uh, try to help each other. Comes up yeah. with great questions. Yeah. Um, I do a wonderful have, place to be, so do come back. I do have a lot of mods, but, uh, you know, it's just that they're not all here at the same time. You and Daryl are here, and I think, uh, you know, Dee Dee will show up sometimes. And Yeah, you're safe when I'm here. Well, I'm not worried about that. You're, you're very good. But, I mean, how many times did we even use that with Skytour live stream? I, right, I know. You know. I've been very, very fortunate. Well, you know, it's like, you know, it's like... Um, it's hard to argue science. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> That's so true. That's so true. Well, anyway, <clears throat> as I'm gagging here. All right, folks. Hey, you guys have a good night, and thank you... Uh, for Daryl to be, thank you, Daryl, and thank you, Amanda, <coughs> for, thank you. for joining us uh, again, fourth night in a row. Always have a good time. <clears throat> I just, I'm, I'm just impressed that um, you chose to come back and uh, that we had a fourth night. So this probably means it won't be clear now for six months. No, I'm kidding. Uh -huh. Now it will be. And uh, if you guys uh, know <clears throat> or hear of any comments that I don't hear about, which uh, could happen. <clears throat> let me know and we'll go hunting comets too uh, but either way I look forward to seeing you again uh, and we'll see you on the Sky Tour live stream next time and don't forget keep looking up except while you're driving good night folks night all